The Theatre Francais by Henry James. M. Francisque Sarsi, the dramatic critic of the Paris, Temps, and the gentleman who, of the whole journalistic fraternity, holds the fortune of a play in the hollow of his hand. Has been publishing during the last year a series of biographical notices of the chief actors and actresses of the first theatre in the world. Comedians et comediennes, la comédie française, such is the title of this publication, which appears in monthly numbers of the Library de Bibliophiles and is ornamented on each occasion with a very prettily etched portrait by M. Gaucherelle, of the artist to whom the number is devoted. By lovers of the stage in general and of the Théâtre Français in particular the series will be found most interesting. And I welcome the pretext for saying a few words about an institution which, if such language be not hyperbolical, I passionately admire. I must add that the portrait is incomplete, though for the present occasion it is more than sufficient. The list of M. Sarcy's biographies is not yet filled up, three or four, those of Madame Favart and of M. M. Fevre and Delaunay, are still wanting. Nine numbers, however, have appeared, the first being entitled La Maison de Molière, and devoted to a general account of the great theatre and the others treating of its principal societaires and pensionnaires in the following order. Renier. Gott. Sophie Coisette. Sarah Bernhard. Coquelin. Madeleine Brohan. Bressant. Madame Plessy. This order, by the way, is purely accidental. It is not that of age or of merit. It is always entertaining to encounter M. Francisque Sarsi, and the reader who, during a Paris winter, has been in the habit, of a Sunday evening, of unfolding his, temps immediately after unfolding his napkin. And glancing down first of all to see what this sturdy Freytonist has found to his hand, such a reader will find him in great force in the pages before us. It is true that, though I myself confess to being such a reader, there are moments when I grow rather weary of M. Sarsi, who has in an eminent degree both the virtues and the defects which attach to the great French characteristic, the habit of taking terribly au sérieux anything that you may set about doing. Of this habit of abounding in one's own sense, of expatiating, elaborating, reiterating, refining, as if for the hour the fate of mankind were bound up with one's particular topic, M. Sarcy is a capital and at times an almost comical representative. He talks about the theatre once a week as if, honestly, between himself and his reader, the theatre were the only thing in this frivolous world that is worth seriously talking about. He has a religious respect for his theme and he holds that if a thing is to be done at all it must be done in detail as well as in the gross. It is to this serious way of taking the matter, to his thoroughly businesslike and professional attitude, to his unwearying attention to detail, that the critic of the temps owes his enviable influence and the weight of his words. Add to this that he is sternly incorruptible. He has his admirations, but they are honest and discriminating, and whom he loveth he very often chasteneth. He is not ashamed to commend MLLEX, who has only had a curtsy to make, if her curtsy has been the ideal curtsy of the situation, and he is not afraid to overhaul M. A., who has delivered the tirade of the play, if M. A., has failed to hit the mark. Of course his judgment is good. When I have had occasion to measure it I have usually found it excellent. He has the scenic sense, the theatrical eye. He knows at a glance what will do, and what will not do. He is shrewd and sagacious and almost tiresomely in earnest, and this is his principal brilliancy. He is homely, familiar and colloquial, he leans his elbows on his desk and does up his weekly budget into a parcel the reverse of coquettish. You can fancy him a grocer retailing tapioca and hominy, full weight for the price, his style seems a sort of integument of brown paper. But the fact remains that if M. Sarsi praises a play the play has a run, and that if M. Sarsi says it will not do it does not do at all. If M. Sarsi devotes an encouraging line and a half to a young actress, Mademoiselle is immediately Lancy, she has a career. If he bestows a quiet, bravo, on an obscure comedian, the gentleman may forthwith renew his engagement. When you make and unmake fortunes at this rate, what matters it whether you have a little elegance the more or the less? Elegance is for M. 
Paul de Saint Victor, who does the theatres in the Moniteur, and who, though he writes a style only a trifle less pictorial than that of Theophile Gautier himself, has never, to the best of my belief, brought clouds or sunshine to any playhouse. I may add, to finish with him, Sarsi, that he contributes a daily political article, generally devoted to watching and showing up the game of the clerical party, to Edmund about's journal, the Zixim Siecla. That he gives a weekly conference on current literature. That he confers also on those excellent Sunday morning performances now so common in the French theatres, during which examples of the classic repertory are presented, accompanied by a light lecture upon the history and character of the play. As the commentator on these occasions, M. Sarcy is in great demand, and he officiates sometimes in small provincial towns. Lastly, frequent playgoers in Paris observe that the very slenderest novelty is sufficient to ensure at a theatre the very considerable, physical presence of the conscientious critic of the temps. If he were remarkable for nothing else he would be remarkable for the fortitude with which he exposes himself to the pestiferous climate of the Parisian temples of the drama. For these agreeable, notices, M. Sarcy appears to have mended his pen and to have given a fillip to his fancy. They are gracefully and often lightly turned, occasionally, even, the author grazes the epigrammatic. They deal, as is proper, with the artistic and not with the private physiognomy of the ladies and gentlemen whom they commemorate. And though they occasionally allude to what the French call, intimate, matters, they contain no satisfaction for the lovers of scandal. The Théâtre Français, in the face it presents to the world, is an austere and venerable establishment, and a frivolous tone about its affairs would be almost as much out of keeping as if applied to the Academy herself. M. Sarcy touches upon the organization of the theatre, and gives some account of the different phases through which it has passed during these latter years. Its chief functionary is a general administrator, or director, appointed by the state, which enjoys this right in virtue of the considerable subsidy which it pays to the house, a subsidy amounting, if I am not mistaken, M. Sarcy does not mention the sum, to 250,000 francs. The director, however, is not an absolute but a constitutional ruler, for he shares his powers with the society itself, which has always had a large deliberative voice. Whence, it may be asked, does the society derive its light and its inspiration? From the past, from precedent, from tradition, from the great unwritten body of laws which no one has in his keeping but many have in their memory, and all in their respect. The principles on which the Théâtre Français rests are a good deal like the common law of England, a vaguely and inconveniently registered mass of regulations which time and occasion have welded together and from which the recurring occasion can usually manage to extract the rightful precedent. Napoleon I, who had a finger in every pie in his dominion, found time during his brief and disastrous occupation of Moscow to send down a decree remodeling and regulating the constitution of the theatre. This document has long been a dead letter, and the society abides by its older traditions. The traditions of the Comédie Française, that is the sovereign word, and that is the charm of the place, the charm that one never ceases to feel, however often one may sit beneath the classic, dusky dome. One feels this charm with peculiar intensity as a newly arrived foreigner. The Théâtre Français has had the good fortune to be able to allow its traditions to accumulate. They have been preserved, transmitted, respected, cherished, until at last they form the very atmosphere, the vital air, of the establishment. A stranger feels their superior influence the first time he sees the great curtain go up. He feels that he is in a theatre that is not as other theatres are. It is not only better, it is different. It has a peculiar perfection, something consecrated, historical, academic. This impression is delicious, and he watches the performance in a sort of tranquil ecstasy. Never has he seen anything so smooth and harmonious, so artistic and complete. He has heard all his life of attention to detail, and now, for the first time, he sees something that deserves the name. He sees dramatic effort refined to a point with which the English stage is unacquainted. He sees that there are no limits to possible finish, and that so trivial an act as taking a letter from a servant or placing one's hat on a chair may be made a suggestive and interesting incident. 
He sees these things and a great many more besides, but at first he does not analyze them, he gives himself up to sympathetic contemplation. He is in an ideal and exemplary world, a world that has managed to attain all the felicities that the world we live in misses. The people do the things that we should like to do, they are gifted as we should like to be. They have mastered the accomplishments that we have had to give up. The women are not all beautiful, decidedly not, indeed, but they are graceful, agreeable, sympathetic, ladylike. They have the best manners possible and they are delightfully well dressed. They have charming musical voices and they speak with irreproachable purity and sweetness. They walk with the most elegant grace and when they sit it is a pleasure to see their attitudes. They go out and come in, they pass across the stage, they talk, and laugh, and cry, they deliver long tirades or remain statuesquely mute. They are tender or tragic, they are comic or conventional, and through it all you never observe an awkwardness, a roughness, an accident, a crude spot, a false note. As for the men, they are not handsome either. It must be confessed, indeed, that at the present hour manly beauty is but scantily represented at the Théâtre Francais. Bressant, I believe, used to be thought handsome. But Bressant has retired, and among the gentlemen of the troupe I can think of no one but M. Manette Sully who may be positively commended for his fine person. But M. Manette Sully is, from the scenic point of view, an Adonis of the first magnitude. To be handsome, however, is for an actor one of the last necessities, and these gentlemen are mostly handsome enough. They look perfectly what they are intended to look, and in cases where it is proposed that they shall seem handsome, they usually succeed. They are as well-mannered and as well-dressed as their fairer comrades and their voices are no less agreeable and effective. They represent gentlemen and they produce the illusion. In this endeavor they deserve even greater credit than the actresses, for in modern comedy, of which the repertory of the Théâtre Francais is largely composed, they have nothing in the way of costume to help to carry it off. Half a dozen ugly men, in the periodic coat and trousers and stovepipe hat, with blue chins and false mustaches, strutting before the footlights, and pretending to be interesting, romantic, pathetic, heroic, certainly play a perilous game. At every turn they suggest prosaic things and the usual liability to awkwardness is meantime increased a thousandfold. But the comedians of the Théâtre Francais are never awkward, and when it is necessary they solve triumphantly the problem of being at once realistic to the eye and romantic to the imagination. I am speaking always of one's first impression of them. There are spots on the sun, and you discover after a while that there are little irregularities at the Théâtre Francais. But the acting is so incomparably better than any that you have seen that criticism for a long time is content to lie dormant. I shall never forget how at first I was under the charm. I liked the very incommodities of the place, I am not sure that I did not find a certain mystic salubrity in the bad ventilation. The Théâtre Francais, it is known, gives you a good deal for your money. The performance, which rarely ends before midnight, and sometimes transgresses it, frequently begins by seven o'clock. The first hour or two is occupied by secondary performers, but not for the world at this time would I have missed the first rising of the curtain. No dinner could be too hastily swallowed to enable me to see, for instance, Madame Natalie in Octave Fulet's charming little comedy of Le Village. Madame Natalie was a plain, stout old woman, who did the mothers and aunts and elderly wives. I use the past tense because she retired from the stage a year ago, leaving a most conspicuous vacancy. She was an admirable actress and a perfect mistress of laughter and tears. In Lou Village, she played an old provincial bourgeois whose husband takes it into his head, one winter night, to start on the tour of Europe with a roving bachelor friend, who has dropped down on him at suppertime, after the lapse of years and has gossiped him into momentary discontent with his fireside existence. My pleasure was in Madame Natalie's figure when she came in dressed to go out to Vespers across the place. The two foolish old cronies are over their wine, talking of the beauty of the women on the Ionian coast. You hear the church bell in the distance. It was the quiet felicity of the old lady's dress that used to charm me, the comédie française was in every fold of it. She wore a large black silk mantilla, of a peculiar cut, 
which looked as if she had just taken it tenderly out of some old wardrobe where it lay folded in lavender, and a large dark bonnet, adorned with handsome black silk loops and bows. Her big pale face had a softly frightened look, and in her hand she carried her neatly kept breviary. The extreme suggestiveness, and yet the taste and temperance of this costume, seemed to me inimitable. The bonnet alone, with its handsome, decent, virtuous bows, was worth coming to see. It expressed all the rest, and you saw the excellent, pious woman go pick her steps churchward among the puddles, while Jeanette, the cook, in a high white cap, marched before her in sabots with a lantern. Such matters are trifles, but they are representative trifles, and they are not the only ones that I remember. It used to please me, when I had squeezed into my stall, the stalls at the Francais are extremely uncomfortable, to remember of how great a history the large, dim salle around me could boast, how many great things had happened there. How the air was thick with associations. Even if I had never seen Rachel, it was something of a consolation to think that those very footlights had illumined her finest moments and that the echoes of her mighty voice were sleeping in that dingy dome. From this to musing upon the traditions of the place, of which I spoke just now, was of course but a step. How were they kept? By whom, and where? Who trims the undying lamp and guards the accumulated treasure? I never found out, by sitting in the stalls, and very soon I ceased to care to know. One may be very fond of the stage and yet care little for the green room. Just as one may be very fond of pictures and books and yet be no frequenter of studios and authors' dens. They might pass on the torch as they would behind the scenes. So long as during my time they did not let it drop I made up my mind to be satisfied. And that one could depend upon their not letting it drop became a part of the customary comfort of Parisian life. It became certain that the traditions were not mere catchwords, but a most beneficent reality. Going to the other Parisian theatres helps you to believe in them. Unless you are a voracious theatre-goer you give the others up. You find they do not pay, the Francais does for you all that they do and so much more besides. There are two possible exceptions, the Gymnase and the Polaire Royal. The Gymnase, since the death of Mademoiselle Desclis, has been under a heavy cloud. But occasionally, when a month's sunshine rests upon it, there is a savor of excellence in the performance. But you feel that you are still within the realm of accident, the delightful security of the Rue de Richelieu is wanting. The young lover is liable to be common and the beautifully dressed heroine to have an unpleasant voice. The Palais Royal has always been in its way very perfect, but its way admits of great imperfection. The actresses are classically bad, though usually pretty, and the actors are much addicted to taking liberties. In broad comedy, nevertheless, two or three of the latter are not to be surpassed, and, counting out the women, there is usually something masterly in a Palais Royal performance. In its own line it has what is called style, and it therefore walks, at a distance, in the footsteps of the Francais. The Odeon has never seemed to me in any degree a rival of the Théâtre Francais, though it is a smaller copy of that establishment. It receives a subsidy from the state, and is obliged by its contract to play the classic repertory one night in the week. It is on these nights, listening to Molière or Marivaux, that you may best measure the superiority of the greater theatre. I have seen actors at the Odeon, in the classic repertory, imperfect in their texts, a monstrously insupposable case at the Comédie Française. The function of the Odeon is to operate as a pepiniere or nursery for its elder, to try young talents, shape them, make them flexible and then hand them over to the upper house. The more especial nursery of the Francais, however, is the Conservatoire Dramatique, an institution dependent upon the state, through the Ministry of the Fine Arts, whose budget is charged with the remuneration of its professors. Pupils graduating from the Conservatoire with a prize have ipso facto the right to debuter at the Théâtre Francais, which retains them or lets them go, according to its discretion. Most of the first subjects of the Francais have done their two years' work at the Conservatoire, and M. Sarcy holds that an actor who has not had that fundamental training which is only to be acquired there never obtains a complete mastery of his resources. Nevertheless some of the best actors of the day have owed nothing to the Conservatoire, 
Bressant, for instance, and Amy Desclee, the latter of whom, indeed, never arrived at the Francais. Moliere and Balzac were not of the Academy, and so Mli. Desclee, the first actress after Rachel, died without acquiring the privilege which M. Sarcy says is the daydream of all young theatrical women, that of printing on their visiting cards, after their name, the La Comédie Française. The Théâtre Français has, moreover, the right to do as Molière did, to claim its property wherever it finds it. It may stretch out its long arm and break the engagement of a promising actor at any of the other theatres. Of course after a certain amount of notice given. So, last winter, it notified to the gymnase its design of appropriating worms, the admirable Jeune Premier, who, returning from a long sojourn in Russia and taking the town by surprise, had begun to retrieve the shrunken fortunes of that establishment. On the whole, it may be said that the great talents find their way, sooner or later, to the Théâtre Francais. This is of course not a rule that works unvaryingly, for there are a great many influences to interfere with it. Interest as well as merit, especially in the case of the actresses, weighs in the scale, and the ire that may exist in celestial minds has been known to manifest itself in the councils of the comedy. Moreover, a brilliant actress may prefer to reign supreme at one of the smaller theatres, at the Francais, inevitably, she shares her dominion. The honour is less, but the comfort is greater. Nevertheless, at the Francais, in a general way, there is in each case a tolerably obvious artistic reason for membership. And if you see a clever actor remain outside for years, you may be pretty sure that, though private reasons count, there are artistic reasons as well. The first half dozen times I saw Mademoiselle Farguel, who for years ruled the roost, as the vulgar saying is, at the vaudeville, I wondered that so consummate and accomplished an actress should not have a place on the first French stage. But I presently grew wiser, and perceived that, clever as Mademoiselle Farguel is, she is not for the Rue de Richelieu, but for the boulevards, her peculiar, intensely Parisian intonation would sound out of place in the Maison de Molière. Of course if Mademoiselle Farguel has ever received overtures from the Francais, my sagacity is at fault, I am looking through a millstone. But I suspect she has not. Frédéric Lemaitre, who died last winter, and who was a very great actor, had been tried at the Francais and found wanting, for those particular conditions. But it may probably be said that if Frederick was wanting, the theatre was too, in this case. Frederick's great force was his extravagance, his fantasticality, and the stage of the Rue de Richelieu was a trifle too academic. I have even wondered whether Desclee, if she had lived, would have trod that stage by right, and whether it would have seemed her proper element. The negative is not impossible. It is very possible that in that classic atmosphere her great charm, her intensely modern quality, her super subtle realism, would have appeared an anomaly. I can imagine even that her strange, touching, nervous voice would not have seemed the voice of the house. At the Francais you must know how to acquit yourself of a tirade, that has always been the touchstone of capacity. It would probably have proved Desclee's stumbling block, though she could utter speeches of six words as no one else surely has ever done. It is true that Mademoiselle Croisette, and in a certain sense Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhard, are rather weak at their tirades. But then old theatre-goers will tell you that these young ladies, in spite of a hundred attractions, have no business at the Francais. In the course of time the susceptible foreigner passes from that superstitious state of attention which I just now sketched to that greater enlightenment which enables him to understand such a judgment as this of the old theatre-goers. It is borne in upon him that, as the good Homer sometimes nods, the Théâtre Francais sometimes lapses from its high standard. He makes various reflections. He thinks that Mademoiselle Favart rants. He thinks M. Manette Sully, in spite of his delicious voice, insupportable. He thinks that M. Parody's five-act tragedy, Rome Vain Q, presented in the early part of the present winter, was better done certainly than it would have been done upon any English stage, but by no means so much better done as might have been expected. Here, if I had space, I would open a long parenthesis. In which I should aspire to demonstrate that the incontestable superiority of average French acting to English is by no means so strongly marked in tragedy as in comedy, 
is indeed sometimes not strongly marked at all. The reason of this is in a great measure, I think, that we have had Shakespeare to exercise ourselves upon. And that an inferior dramatic instinct exercised upon Shakespeare may become more flexible than a superior one exercised upon Corneille and Racine. When it comes to ranting, ranting even in a modified and comparatively reasonable sense, we do, I suspect, quite as well as the French, if not rather better. Mr. G. H. Lewis, in his entertaining little book Upon Actors and the Art of Acting, mentions M. Talbot, of the Francais, as a surprisingly incompetent performer. My memory assents to his judgment at the same time that it proposes an amendment. This actor's special line is the buffeted, bemuddled, besotted old fathers, uncles and guardians of classic comedy, and he plays them with his face much more than with his tongue. Nature has endowed him with a visage so admirably adapted, once for all, to his role, that he has only to sit in a chair, with his hands folded on his stomach, to look like a monument of bewildered senility. After that it does not matter what he says or how he says it. The comedy Francaise sometimes does weaker things than in keeping M. Talbot. Last autumn, seven for instance, it was really depressing to see Mademoiselle Dudley brought all the way from Brussels, and with not a little flourish either, to create the guilty vestal in Rome Vain Q. As far as the interests of art are concerned, Mademoiselle Dudley had much better have remained in the Flemish capital, of whose language she is apparently a perfect mistress. It is hard, too, to forgive M. Perrin, M. Perrin is the present director of the Théâtre Français, for bringing out Lamy Fritz of M. Berkman Chatrian. The two gentlemen who write under this name have a double claim to kindness. In the first place, they have produced some delightful little novels, everyone knows and admires Le Conscript to 1813, everyone admires, indeed, the charming tale on which the play in question is founded. In the second place, they were, before the production of their piece, the objects of a scurrilous attack by the Figaro newspaper, which held the authors up to reprobation for having insulted the army, and did its best to lay the train for a hostile manifestation on the first night. It may be added that the good sense of the public outbalanced the impudence of the newspaper, and the play was simply advertised into success. But neither the novels nor the persecutions of M. Berkman Chatrian availed to render Lamy Fritz, in its would be dramatic form, worthy of the first French stage. It is played as well as possible, and upholstered even better, but it is, according to the vulgar phrase, too thin for the locality. Upholstery has never played such a part at the Theatre Francais as during the reign of M. Perrin, who came into power, if I mistake not, after the late war. He proved very early that he was a radical, and he has introduced a hundred novelties. His administration, however, has been brilliant, and in his hands the Theatre Francais has made money. This it had rarely done before, and this, in the conservative view, is quite beneath its dignity. To the conservative view I should humbly incline. An institution so closely protected by a rich and powerful state ought to be able to cultivate art for art. The first of M. Sarcy's biographies, to which I have been too long in coming, is devoted to Renier, a veteran actor, who left the stage four or five years since, and who now fills the office of oracle to his younger comrades. It is the indispensable thing, says M. Sarcy, for a young aspirant to be able to say that he has had lessons of M. Renier, or that M. Renier had advised him, or that he has talked such and such a point over with M. Renier. His comrades always speak of him as M. Renier, never as simple Renier. I have had the fortune to see him but once, it was the first time I ever went to the Théâtre Francais. He played Don Annibal in Émile Augier's romantic comedy of L'Aventurière, and I have not forgotten the exquisite humor of the performance. The part is that of a sort of 17th century Captain Costigan, only the Miss Fotheringay in the case is the gentleman's sister and not his daughter. This lady is moreover an ambitious and designing person, who leads her threadbare braggart of a brother quite by the nose. She has entrapped a worthy gentleman of Padua, of mature years, and he is on the eve of making her his wife, when his son, a clever young soldier, beguiles Don Annibal into supping with him. 
and makes him drink so deep that the prating adventurer at last lets the cat out of the bag and confides to his companion that the fair Clarinda is not the virtuous gentlewoman she appears. But a poor strolling actress who has had a lover at every stage of her journey. The scene was played by Bressant and Renier, and it has always remained in my mind as one of the most perfect things I have seen on the stage. The gradual action of the wine upon Don Annibal, the delicacy with which his deepening tipsiness was indicated, its intellectual rather than physical manifestation, and, in the midst of it, the fantastic conceit which made him think that he was winding his fellow drinker round his fingers, all this was exquisitely rendered. Drunkenness on the stage is usually both dreary and disgusting. And I can remember besides this but two really interesting pictures of intoxication, excepting always, indeed, the immortal tipsiness of Cassio in Othello, which a clever actor can always make touching. One is the beautiful befuddlement of Rip Van Winkle, as Mr. Joseph Jefferson renders it, and the other, a memory of the Théâtre Francais, the scene in the Duke Job, in which God succumbs to mild inebriation, and dozes in his chair just boozily enough for the young girl who loves him to make it out. It is to this admirable Emile Gott that M. Sarcy's second notice is devoted. God is at the present hour unquestionably the first actor at the Théâtre Francais, and I have personally no hesitation in accepting him as the first of living actors. His younger comrade, Coquelin, has, I think, as much talent and as much art, as the older man got has the longer and fuller record and may therefore be spoken of as the master. If I were obliged to rank the half-dozen premier sujets of the last few years at the Théâtre Francais in their absolute order of talent, thank heaven, I am not so obliged. I think I should make up some such little list as this, Gott, Coquelin, Madame Plessy, Sarah Bernhard, Mademoiselle Favart, Delaunay. I confess that I have no sooner written it than I feel as if I ought to amend it, and wonder whether it is not a great folly to put Delaunay after Mademoiselle Favart. But this is idle. As for God, he is a singularly interesting actor. I have often wondered whether the best definition of him would not be to say that he is really a philosophic actor. He is an immense humorist and his comicality is sometimes colossal, but his most striking quality is the one on which M. Sarsi dwells, his sobriety and profundity, his underlying element of manliness and melancholy, the impression he gives you of having a general conception of human life and of seeing the relativity, as one may say, of the character he represents. Of all the comic actors I have seen he is the least trivial, at the same time that for richness of detail his comic manner is unsurpassed. His repertory is very large and various, but it may be divided into two equal halves, the parts that belong to reality and the parts that belong to fantasy. There is of course a great deal of fantasy in his realistic parts and a great deal of reality in his fantastic ones, but the general division is just, and at times, indeed, the two faces of his talent seem to have little in common. The Duc job, to which I just now alluded, is one of the things he does most perfectly. The part, which is that of a young man, is a serious and tender one. It is amazing that the actor who plays it should also be able to carry off triumphantly the frantic buffoonery of Maitre Pathlin, or should represent the Sganarelle of the Medicine Malgar Louis with such an unctuous breadth of humor. The two characters, perhaps, which have given me the liveliest idea of God's power and fertility are the Maitre Pathlin and the M. Poirier who figures in the title to the comedy which Emile Augier and Jules Sandeau wrote together. M. Poirier the retired shopkeeper who marries his daughter to a marquis and makes acquaintance with the incommodities incidental to such a piece of luck, is perhaps the actor's most elaborate creation. It is difficult to see how the portrayal of a type and an individual can have a larger sweep and a more minute completeness. The Bonhomme Poirier, in God's hands, is really great. And half a dozen of the actor's modern parts that I could mention are hardly less brilliant. But when I think of him I instinctively think first of some role in which he wears the cap and gown of a period as regards which humorous invention may fairly take the bit in its teeth. This is what God lets it do in Maitre Pathlin, and he leads the spectator's exhilarated fancy a dance to which the latter's aching sides on the morrow sufficiently testify. The piece is a ratio of a medieval farce which has the credit of being the first play not a mystery, 
or a miracle piece in the records of the French drama. The plot is extremely bald and primitive. It sets forth how a cunning lawyer undertook to purchase a dozen ells of cloth for nothing. In the first scene we see him in the marketplace, bargaining and haggling with the draper, and then marching off with the roll of cloth, with the understanding that the shopman shall call at his house in the course of an hour for the money. In the next act we have Maitre Pathlin at his fireside with his wife, to whom he relates his trick and its projected sequel, and who greets them with Homeric laughter. He gets into bed, and the innocent draper arrives. Then follows a scene of which the liveliest description must be ineffective. Pathlin pretends to be out of his head, to be overtaken by a mysterious malady which has made him delirious, not to know the draper from Adam, never to have heard of the dozen ells of cloth. And to be altogether an impossible person to collect a debt from. To carry out this character he indulges in a series of indescribable antics, out bedlam's bedlam, frolics over the room dressed out in the bedclothes and chanting the wildest gibberish. Bewilders the poor draper to within an inch of his own sanity and finally puts him utterly to rout. The spectacle could only be portentously flat or heroically successful, and in God's hands this latter was its fortune. His Scanarelle, in the Medicine Malgar Louis, and half a dozen of his characters from Moliere besides, such a part, too, as his Tibia, in Alfred de Musset's charming bit of Romanticism. The Caprices de Marianne have a certain generic resemblance with his treatment of the figure I have sketched. In all these things the comicality is of the exuberant and tremendous order, and yet in spite of its richness and flexibility it suggests little connection with high animal spirits. It seems a matter of invention, of reflection and irony. You cannot imagine God representing a fool pure and simple, or at least a passive and unsuspecting fool. There must always be an element of shrewdness and even of contempt, he must be the man who knows and judges, or at least who pretends. It is a compliment, I take it, to an actor, to say that he prompts you to wonder about his private personality, and an observant spectator of M. Gott is at liberty to guess that he is both obstinate and proud. In Coquelin there is perhaps greater spontaneity, and there is a not inferior mastery of his art. He is a wonderfully brilliant, elastic actor. He is but thirty-five years old, and yet his record is most glorious. He too has his actual and his classical repertory, and here also it is hard to choose. As the young valet de comedy in Moliere and Regnard and Marivaux he is incomparable. I shall never forget the really infernal brilliancy of his masquerille in La Tourdie. His volubility, his rapidity, his impudence and gaiety, his ringing, penetrating voice and the shrill trumpet note of his laughter, make him the ideal of the classic serving man of the classic young lover, half rascal and half good fellow. Coquelin has lately had two or three immense successes in the comedies of the day. His Duc de Septembermonts, in the famous Etrangera of Alexander Dumas, last winter, was the capital creation of the piece. And in the revival, this winter, of Augier's Paul Forestier, his Adolphe de Beaubourg, the young man about town, consciously tainted with commonness, and trying to shake off the incubus. Seemed while one watched it and listened to it the last word of delicately humorous art. Of Coquelin's eminence in the old comedies M. Sarcy speaks with a certain pictorial force, no one is better cut out to represent those bold and magnificent rascals of the old repertory, with their boisterous gaiety, their brilliant fancy and their superb extravagance. Who give to their buffoonery J. Iniseus qua diapique. In these parts one may say of Coquelin that he is incomparable. I prefer him to God in such cases, and even to Renier, his master. I never saw Monroe's, and cannot speak of him. But good judges have assured me that there was much that was factitious in the manner of this eminent comedian, and that his vivacity was a trifle mechanical. There is nothing whatever of this in Coquelin's manner. The eye, the nose, and the voice, the voice above all, are his most powerful means of action. He launches his tirades all in one breath, with full lungs, without troubling himself too much over the shading of details, in large masses, and he possesses himself only the more strongly of the public, which has a great sense of ensemble. The words that must be detached, the words that must decisively, tell, glitter in this delivery with the sonorous ring of a brand new Louis d'Or. 
Crispin, Scapin, Figaro, Mascaril have never found a more valiant and joyous interpreter. I should say that this was enough about the men at the Théâtre Francais, if I did not remember that I have not spoken of Delaunay. But Delaunay has plenty of people to speak for him. He has, in especial, the more eloquent half of humanity, the ladies. I suppose that of all the actors of the Comédie Française he is the most universally appreciated and admired, he is the popular favorite. And he has certainly earned this distinction, for there was never a more amiable and sympathetic genius. He plays the young lovers of the past and the present, and he acquits himself of his difficult and delicate task with extraordinary grace and propriety. The danger I spoke of a while since, the danger, for the actor of a romantic and sentimental part, of being compromised by the coat and trousers, the hat and umbrella of the current year, are reduced by Delaunay to their minimum. He reconciles in a marvelous fashion the lovesick gallant of the ideal world with the gentlemanly man of today, and his passion is as far removed from rant as his propriety is from stiffness. He has been accused of late years of falling into a mannerism, and I think there is some truth in the charge. But the fault in Delaunay's situation is certainly venial. How can a man of fifty, to whom, as regards face and figure, nature has been stingy, play an amorous swain of twenty without taking refuge in a mannerism? His mannerism is a legitimate device for diverting the spectator's attention from certain incongruities. Delaunay's juvenility, his ardor, his passion, his good taste and sense of fitness, have always an irresistible charm. As he has grown older he has increased his repertory by parts of greater weight and sobriety, he has played the husbands as well as the lovers. One of his most recent and brilliant creations of this kind is his Marquis de Presles in Le Gendre de M. Poirier, a piece of acting superb for its lightness and decent vulture. It cannot be better praised than by saying it was worthy of God's inimitable rendering of the part opposed to it. But I think I shall remember Delaunay best in the picturesque and romantic comedies, as the Duc de Richelieu in MLLE de Belle Isle. As the joyous, gallant, exuberant young hero, his plumes and love knots fluttering in the breath of his gushing improvisation, of Corneille's Menta. Or, most of all, as the melodious swains of those charmingly poetic, faintly, naturally Shakespearean little comedies of Alfred de Musset. To speak of Delaunay ought to bring us properly to Mademoiselle Favart, who for so many years invariably represented the object of his tender invocations. Mademoiselle Favart at the present time rather lacks what the French call actuality. She has recently made an attempt to recover something of that large measure of it which she once possessed, but I doubt whether it has been completely successful. M. Sarcy has not yet put forth his notice of her. And when he does so it will be interesting to see how he treats her. She is not one of his high admirations. She is a great talent that has passed into eclipse. I call her a great talent, although I remember the words in which M. Sarsi somewhere speaks of her, M. L. L. E. Favart, who, to happy natural gifts, sutinus par un travail a carn, owed a distinguished place, etc. Her talent is great, but the impression that she gives of a travail a carn and of an insatiable ambition is perhaps even greater. For many years she reigned supreme, and I believe she is accused of not having always reigned generously. However that may be, there came a day when Mademoiselle Croisette and Sarah Bernhard passed to the front and the elder actress receded, if not into the background, at least into what painters call the middle distance. The private history of these events has, I believe, been rich in heartburnings but it is only with the public history that we are concerned. Mademoiselle Favart has always seemed to me a powerful rather than an interesting actress. There is usually something mechanical and overdone in her manner. In some of her parts there is a kind of audible creaking of the machinery. If Delaunay is open to the reproach of having let a mannerism get the better of him, this accusation is much more fatally true of Mademoiselle Favart. On the other hand, she knows her trade as no one does, no one, at least, save Madame Plessy. When she is bad she is extremely bad, and sometimes she is interruptedly bad for a whole evening. In the revival of Scribe's clever comedy of Un Chien, this winter, which, by the way, though the cast included both God and Coquelin, was the nearest approach to mediocrity I have ever seen at the Théâtre Francais, Mademoiselle Favart was.
to my sense, startlingly bad. The part had originally been played by Madame Plessy, and I remember how M. Sarcy in his feuilleton treated its actual representative. Mademoiselle Favart does Louise. Who does not recall the exquisite delicacy and temperance with which Madame Plessy rendered that difficult scene in the second act, etc. And nothing more. When, however, Mademoiselle Favart is at her best, she is remarkably strong. She rises to great occasions. I doubt whether such parts as the desperate heroine of the Supplice d'une femme, or as Julie in Octave Fulet's lugubrious drama of that name, could be more effectively played than she plays them. She can carry a great weight without flinching. She has what the French call authority, and in declamation she sometimes unrolls her fine voice, as it were, in long harmonious waves and cadences the sustained power of which her younger rivals must often envy her. I am drawing to the close of these rather desultory observations without having spoken of the four ladies commemorated by M. Sarcy in the publication which lies before me. And I do not know that I can justify my tardiness otherwise than by saying that writing and reading about artists of so extreme a personal brilliancy is poor work, and that the best the critic can do is to wish his reader may see them. From a quiet photo, as speedily and as often as possible. Of Madeleine Brohan, indeed, there is little to say. She is a delightful person to listen to, and she is still delightful to look at, in spite of that redundancy of contour which time has contributed to her charms. But she has never been ambitious and her talent has had no particularly original quality. It is a long time since she created an important part. But in the old repertory her rich, dense voice, her charming smile, her mellow, tranquil gaiety, always give extreme pleasure. To hear her sit and talk, simply, and laugh and play with her fan, along with Madame Plessy, in Moliere's, Critique de l'École de Femmes, is an entertainment to be remembered. For Madame Plessy I should have to mend my pen and begin a new chapter. And for Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhard no less a ceremony would suffice. I saw Madame Plessy for the first time in Émile Augier's Aventurière, when, as I mentioned, I first saw Renier. This is considered by many persons her best part, and she certainly carries it off with a high hand, but I like her better in characters which afford more scope to her talents for comedy. These characters are very numerous, for her activity and versatility have been extraordinary. Her comedy of course is high, it is of the highest conceivable kind, and she has often been accused of being too mincing and too artificial. I should never make this charge, for, to me, Madame Plessy's minodries, her grand airs and her arch refinements, have never been anything but the odorous swayings and queenly tossings of some splendid garden flower. Never had an actress grander manners. When Madame Plessy represents a duchess you have no allowances to make. Her limitations are on the side of the pathetic. If she is brilliant, she is cold, and I cannot imagine her touching the source of tears. But she is in the highest degree accomplished, she gives an impression of intelligence and intellect which is produced by none of her companions, excepting always the extremely exceptional Sarah Bernhardt. Madame Plessy's intellect has sometimes misled her, as, for instance, when it whispered to her, a few years since, that she could play Agrippine in Racine's Britannicus, on that tragedy being presented for the debuts of Manette Sully. I was verdant enough to think her Agrippine very fine. But M. Sarcy reminds his readers of what he said of it the Monday after the first performance. I will not say, he quotes himself, that Madame Plessy is indifferent. With her intelligence, her natural gifts, her great situation, her immense authority over the public, one cannot be indifferent in anything. She is therefore not indifferently bad. She is bad to a point that cannot be expressed and that would be distressing for dramatic art if it were not that in this great shipwreck there rise to the surface a few floating fragments of the finest qualities that nature has ever bestowed upon. An artist. Madame Plessy retired from the stage six months ago and it may be said that the void produced by this event is irreparable. There is not only no prospect, but there is no hope of filling it up. The present conditions of artistic production are directly hostile to the formation of actresses as consummate and as complete as Madame Plessy. 
one may not expect to see her like, any more than one may expect to see a new manufacture of old lace and old brocade. She carried off with her something that the younger generation of actresses will consistently lack, a certain largeness of style and robustness of art. These qualities are in a modified degree those of Mademoiselle Favart. But if the younger actresses have the success of Mademoiselle Croisette and Sarah Bernhard, will they greatly care whether they are not robust? These young ladies are children of a later and eminently contemporary type, according to which an actress undertakes not to interest but to fascinate. They are charming, awfully charming, strange, eccentric, imaginative. It would be needless to speak specifically of Mademoiselle Croisette. For although she has very great attractions I think she may, by the cold impartiality of science, be classified as a secondary, a less inspired and, to use the great word of the day, a more, brutal, Sarah Bernhard. Mademoiselle Croisette's, brutality, is her great card. As for Mademoiselle Sarah Bernhard, she is simply, at present, in Paris, one of the great figures of the day. It would be hard to imagine a more brilliant embodiment of feminine success. She deserves a chapter for herself. December, 1876 Theocritus on Cape Cod by Hamilton Wright Maybe Cape Cod lies at the other end of the world from Sicily not only in distance, but in the look of it, the lay of it, the way of it. It is so far off that it offers a base from which one may get a fresh view of Theocritus. There are very pleasant villages on the Cape, in the wide shade of ancient elms, set deep in the old-time New England quiet. For there was a time before the arrival of the Syrians, the Armenians, and the automobile, when New England was in a meditative mood. But Cape Cod is really a ridge of sand with a backbone of soil, rashly thrust into the Atlantic, and as fluent and volatile, so to speak, as one of those far western rivers that are shifting currents sublimely indifferent to private ownership. The Cape does not lack stability, but it shifts its lines with easy disregard of charts and boundaries, and remains stable only at its center, it is always fraying at the edges. It lies, too, on the western edge of the ocean stream, where the forces of land and sea are often at war and the palette of colors is limited. The Sirocco does not sift fine sand through every crevice and fill the heart of man with murderous impulses, but the east wind diffuses a kind of elemental depression. Sicily, on the other hand, is high built on rocky foundations, and is the widespreading reach of a great volcano sloping broadly and leisurely to the sea. It is often shaken at its center, but the sea does not take from nor add to its substance at will. It lies in the very heart of a sea of such ravishing color that by sheer fecundity of beauty it has given birth to a vast fellowship of gods and divinely fashioned creatures. Its slopes are white with billowy masses of almond blossoms in that earlier spring which is late winter on Cape Cod. While grey-green, gnarled, and twisted olive trees bear witness to the passionate moods of the Mediterranean, mother of poetry, comedy, and tragedy, often asleep in a dream of beauty in which the shadowy figures of the oldest time move. Often as violent as the North Atlantic when March torments it with furious moods. For the Mediterranean is as seductive, beguiling, and uncertain of temper as Cleopatra, as radiant as Hera, as voluptuous as Aphrodite. Put in terms of color, it is as different from the sea round Cape Cod as a picture by Sorala is different from a picture by Mauve. Theocritus is interested in the magic of the island rather than in the mystery of the many-sounding sea, and to him the familiar look of things is never edged like a photograph. It is as solid and real as a report of the Department of Agriculture, but a mist of poetry is spread over it, in which, as in a Whistler nocturne, many details harmonize in a landscape at once actual and visionary. There is no example in literature of the unison of sight and vision more subtly and elusively harmonious than the report of Sicily in the Idols. In its occupations the island was as prosaic as Cape Cod, and lacked the far-reaching consciousness of the great world which is the possession of every populated sandbar in the Western world. But it was enveloped in an atmosphere in which the edges of things were lost in a sense of their rootage in poetic relations, and of interrelations so elusive and immaterial that a delicate but persistent charm exhaled from them. Sicily was a solid and stubborn reality thousands of years before Theocritus struck his pastoral lyre, but its most obvious quality was atmospheric. 
It was compacted of facts, but they were seen not as a camera sees, but as an artist sees. Not in sharp outline and hard actuality, but softened by a flood of light which melts all hard lines in a landscape vibrant and shimmering. Our landscape painters are now reporting nature as Theocritus saw her in Sicily. The value of the overtone matching the value of the undertone, to quote an artist's phrase, apply these tones in right proportions, writes Mr. Harrison, and you will find that the sky painted with the perfectly matched tone will fly away indefinitely, will be bathed in a perfect atmosphere. We who have for a time lost the poetic mood and strayed from the poet's standpoint paint the undertones with entire fidelity. But we do not paint in the overtones, and the landscape loses the luminous and vibrant quality which comes into it when the sky rains light upon it. We see with the accuracy of the camera. We do not see with the vision of the poet, in which reality is not sacrificed, but subdued to larger uses. We insist on the scientific fact, the poet is intent on the visual fact. The one gives the bare structure of the landscape. The other gives us its color, atmosphere, charm. Here, perhaps, is the real difference between Cape Cod and Sicily. It is not so much a contrast between encircling seas and the sand ridge and rock ridge as between the two ways of seeing, the scientific and the poetic. The difference of soils must also be taken into account. The soil of history on Cape Cod is almost as thin as the physical soil, which is so light and detached that it is blown about by all the winds of heaven. In Sicily, on the other hand, the soil is so much a part of the substance of the island that the Sirocco must bring from the shores of Africa the fine particles with which it tortures men. On Cape Cod there are a few colonial traditions, many heroic memories of brave deeds in awful seas, some records of prosperous daring in fishing ships, and then the advent of the summer colonists. A creditable history, but of so recent date that it has not developed the fructifying power of a rich soil, out of which atmosphere rises like an exhalation. In Sicily, on the other hand, the soil of history is so deep that the spade of the archaeologist has not touched bottom, and even the much-toiling freeman found for octavo volumes too cramped to tell the whole story. And mercifully stopped at the death of Agathocles. Since the beginning of history, which means only the brief time since we began to remember events, everybody has gone to Sicily, and most people have stayed there until they were driven on, or driven out, by later comers. And almost everybody has been determined to keep the island for himself, and set about it with an ingenuity and energy of slaughter which make the movement toward universal peace seem pallid and nerveless. It is safe to say that on no bit of ground of equal area has more history been enacted than in Sicily, and when Theocritus was young, Sicily was already venerable with years and experience. Now, history, using the word as signifying things which have happened, although enacted on the ground, gets into the air, and one often feels it before he knows it. In this volatile and pervasive form it is diffused over the landscape and becomes atmospheric. An atmosphere, it must be remembered, bears the same relation to air that the countenance bears to the face, it reveals and expresses what is behind the physical features. There is hardly a half mile of Sicily below the upper ridges of Etna that has not been fought over, and the localities are few which cannot show the prints of the feet of the gods or of the heroes who were their children. It was a very charming picture on which the curtain was rolled up when history began, but the island was not a theatre in which men sat at ease and looked at Persephone in the arms of Pluto. It was an arena in which race followed close upon race, like the waves of the sea, each rising a little higher and gaining a little wider sweep, and each leaving behind not only wreckage, but layers of soil potent in vitality. The island was as full of strange music, of haunting presences, of far-off memories of tragedy, as the island of the tempest, it bred its calibans, but it bred also its prosperos. For the imagination is nourished by rich associations as an artist is fed by a beautiful landscape. And in Sicily men grew up in an invisible world of memories that spread a heroic glamour over desolate places and kept Olympus within view of the mountain pastures where rude shepherds cut their pipes. A pipe discoursing through nine mouths I made. Full fair to view. The wax is white thereon, the line of this and that edge true. 
The soil of history may be so rich that it nourishes all manner of noxious things side by side with flowers of glorious beauty, this is the price we pay for fertility. A thin soil, on the other hand, sends a few flowers of delicate structure and haunting fragrance into the air, like the Arbutus and the Wichiana, which express the clean, dry sod of Cape Cod. And are symbolic of the poverty and purity of its history. Thoreau reports that in one place he saw advertised, fine sand for sale here, and he ventures the suggestion that some of the street had been sifted. And, possibly, with a little tinge of malice after his long fight with winds and shore drifts, he reports that, in some pictures of Provincetown the persons of the inhabitants are not drawn below the ankles. So much being supposed to be buried in the sand. Nevertheless, he continues, natives of Provincetown assured me that they could walk in the middle of the road without trouble, even in slippers, for they had learned how to put their feet down and lift them up without taking in any sand. On a soil so light and porous there is a plentiful harvesting of health and substantial comfort, but not much chance of poetry. In the country of Theocritus there was great chance for poetry. Not because anybody was taught anything, but because everybody was born in an atmosphere that was a diffused poetry. If this had not been true, the poet could not have spread a soft mist of poesy over the whole island, no man works that kind of magic unaided, he compounds his potion out of simples culled from the fields round him. Theocritus does not disguise the rudeness of the life he describes, goat herds and he goats are not the conventional properties of the poetic stage. The poet was without a touch of the drawing-room consciousness of crude things, though he knew well softness and charm of life in Syracuse under a tyrant who did not patronize the arts, but was instructed by them. To him the distinction between poetic and unpoetic things was not in the appearance, but in the root. He was not ashamed of nature as he found her, and he never apologized for her coarseness by avoiding things not fit for refined eyes. His shepherds and goat herds are often gross and unmannerly, and as stuffed with noisy abuse as Shakespeare's people in Richard III. Lakin and Cometas, rival poets of the field, are having a controversy, and this is the manner of their argument. Lakin. When learned I from thy practice or thy preaching out that's right. Thou puppet, thou misshapen lump of ugliness and spite. Cometas. When. When I beat thee, wailing sore, your goats looked on with glee. And bleated, and were dealt with e'en as I had dealt with thee. And then, without a pause, the landscape shines through the noisy talk. Nay, here are oaks and gallingale, the hum of housing bees. Makes the place pleasant, and the birds are piping in the trees. And here are two cold streamlets. Here deeper shadows fall. Then yon place owns, and look what cones drop from the pine tree tall. Thoreau, to press the analogy from painting a little further, lays the undertones on with a firm hand, it is a wild, rank place and there is no flattery in it. Strewn with crabs, horseshoes, and razor clams, and whatever the sea casts up, a vast morgue, where famished dogs may range in packs, and cows come daily to glean the pittance which the tide leaves them. The carcasses of men and beasts together lie stately up upon its shelf, rotting and bleaching in the sun and waves, and each tide turns them in their beds, and tucks fresh sand under them. There is naked nature, inhumanely sincere, wasting no thought on man, nibbling at the cliffy shore where gulls wheel amid the spray. It certainly is naked nature with a vengeance, and it was hardly fair to take her portrait in that condition. Theocritus would have shown us Actaeon surprising Artemis, not naked, but nude, and there is all the difference between nakedness and nudity that yawns between a Greek statue and a Pompeian fresco indiscreetly preserved in the museum at Naples. Theocritus shows nature nude, but not naked, and it is worth noting that the difference between the two lies in the presence or absence of consciousness. In Greek mythology, nudity passes without note or comment. The moment it begins to be noted and commented upon it becomes nakedness. Theocritus sees nature nude, as did all the Greek poets, but he does not surprise her when she is naked. He paints the undertones faithfully, but he always lays on the overtones, and so spreads the effulgence of the sky stream over the undertones, and the picture becomes vibrant and luminous. The fact is never slurred or ignored. 
It gets full value, but not as a solitary and detached thing untouched by light, unmodified by the landscape. Is there a more charming impression of a landscape bathed in atmosphere, exhaling poetry, breathing in the very presence of divinity, than this, in Calverley's translation? I ceased. He, smiling sweetly as before, gave me the staff, the muses, and leftward sloped toward Pixa. We the while bent us to Frazidines, Eucritus, and I, and baby faced Amintas, there we lay half buried in a couch of fragrant reed, and fresh-cut vine leaves, who so glad as we. A wealth of elm and poplar shook o'erhead. Hard by, a sacred spring flowed gurgling on. From the nymph's grot, and in the somber boughs. The sweet cicada chirped laboriously. Hid in the thick thorn bushes far away. The tree frog's note was heard, the crested lark. Sang with the goldfinch. Turtles made their moan. And o'er the fountain hung the gilded bee. All of rich summer smacked, of autumn all. Pears at our feet, and apples at our side. Rolled in luxuriance, branches on the ground. Sprawled, overweight with damsons. While we brushed. From the cask's head the crust of four long years. Say, ye who dwell upon Parnassian peaks. Nymphs of Castalia. Did old Chiron e'er set before Hercules a cup so brave? In Pholus' cavern, did as nectarous draughts. Cause that a Napian shepherd, in whose hand rocks were as pebbles, Polypheme the strong, featly to foot it o'er the cottage lawns. As, ladies, ye bid flow that day for us. All by Demeter's shrine at harvest home. Beside whose corn stacks may I oft again. Plant my broad fan, while she stands by and smiles. Poppies and corn sheaves on each laden arm. Here is the landscape seen with a poet's eye, and the color and shining quality of a landscape, it must be remembered, are in the exquisitely sensitive eye that sees, not in the structure and substance upon which it rests. The painter and poet create nature as really as they create art, for in every clear sight of the world we are not passive receivers of impressions, but partners in that creative work which makes nature as contemporaneous as the morning newspaper. It is true, Sicily was poetic in its very structure while Cape Cod is poetic only in oases, bits of old New England shade and tracery of elms, the piece of ancient sincerity in content honestly housed. The changing color of marshes in whose channels the tides are singing or mute. But the Sicily of Theocritus was seen by the poetic eye. In every complete vision of a landscape what is behind the eye is as important as what lies before it, and behind the eyes that looked at Sicily in the 3rd century, B.C. There were not only the memories of many generations, but there was also a faith in visible and invisible creatures which peopled the world with divinities. The text of Theocritus is starred with the names of gods and goddesses, of heroes and poets, it is like a rich tapestry, on the surface of which history has been woven in beautiful colors. The flat surface dissolves in a vast distance, and the dull warp and woof glows with moving life. The idols are saturated with religion, and as devoid of piety as a Bernard Shaw play. Gods and men differ only in their power, not at all in their character. What we call morals were as conspicuously absent from Olympus as from Sicily. In both places life and the world are taken in their obvious intention. There was no attempt, apart from the philosophers, who are always an inquisitive folk, to discover either the mind or the heart of things. In the Greek Bible, which Homer composed and recited to crowds of people on festive occasions, the fear of the gods and their vengeance are set forth in a text of unsurpassed force and vitality of imagination. But no god in his most dissolute mood betrays any moral consciousness, and no man repents of sins. That things often go wrong was as obvious then as now, but there was no sense of sin. There were Greeks who prayed, but none who put dust on his head and beat his breast and cried, Woe unto me, a sinner. There were disasters by land and sea, but no newspaper spread them out in shrieking type, and by skillful omission and selection of topics were the semblance of an official report of a madhouse. There were diseases and deaths, 
but patent medicine advertisements had not saturated the common mind with ominous symptoms, old age was present with its monitions of change and decay. Age o'er takes us all. Our tempers first. Then on o'er cheek and chin. Slowly and surely, creep the frosts of time. Up and go somewhere, ere thy limbs are sere. Theocritus came late in the classical age, and the shadows had deepened since Homer's time. The torches on the tombs were inverted, the imagery of immortality was faint and dim, but the natural world was still naturally seen, and, if age was coming down the road, the brave man went bravely forward to meet the shadow. It was different on Cape Cod. Even Thoreau, who had escaped from the morasses of theology into the woods and accomplished the reversion to paganism in the shortest possible manner, never lost the habit of moralizing, which is a survival of the deep-going consciousness of sin. Describing the operations of a sloop dragging for anchors and chains, he gives his text those neat, hard touches of fancy which he had at command even in his most uncompromising. Semi-scientific moments, to hunt today in pleasant weather for anchors which had been lost, the sunken faith and hope of mariners, to which they trusted in vain. Now, perchance it is the rusty one of some old pirate ship or Norman fisherman, whose cable parted here two hundred years ago, and now the best bower anchor of a Canton or California ship which has gone about her business. And then he drops into the depths of the moral subconsciousness from which the clear, clean waters of Walden Pond could not wash him, if the roadsteads of the spiritual ocean could be thus dragged. What rusty flukes of hope deceived and parted chain cables of faith might again be windless aboard. Enough to sink the finder's craft, or stock new navies to the end of time. The bottom of the sea is strewn with anchors, some deeper and some shallower, and alternately covered and uncovered by the sand, perchance with a small length of iron cable still attached, to which where is the other end. So, if we had diving bells adapted to the spiritual deeps, we should see anchors with their cables attached, as thick as eels in vinegar, all wriggling vainly toward their holding ground. But that is not treasure for us which another man has lost. Rather it is for us to seek what no other man has found or can find. The tone is light, almost trifling, when one takes into account the imagery and the idea, and the subconsciousness is wearing thin, but it is still there. Thoreau's individual consciousness was a very faint reflection of an ancestral consciousness of the presence of sin, and of moral obligations of an intensity almost inconceivable in these degenerate days. There was a time in a Cape Cod community when corporal punishment was inflicted on all residents who denied the scriptures, and all persons who stood outside the meeting house during the time of divine service were set in the stocks. The way of righteousness was not a straight and narrow path, but a macadamized thoroughfare, and woe to the man who ventured on a by-path. One is not surprised to learn that hysteric fits were very common, and that congregations were often thrown into the utmost confusion for the preaching was far from quieting. Some think sinning ends with this life, said a well-known preacher, but it is a mistake. The creature is held under an everlasting law, the damned increase in sin in hell. Possibly, the mention of this may please thee. But, remember, there shall be no pleasant sins there, no eating, drinking, singing, dancing, wanton dalliance, and drinking stolen waters, but damned sins, bitter, hellish sins, sins exasperated by torments, cursing God, spite, rage, and blasphemy. The guilt of all thy sins shall be laid upon thy soul, and be made so many heaps of fuel. He damns sinners heaps upon heaps. It is not surprising to learn that as a result of such preaching the hearers were several times greatly alarmed, and, on one occasion a comparatively innocent young man was frightened nearly out of his wits. One wonders in what precise sense the word, comparatively, was used, it is certain that those who had this sense of the sinfulness of things driven into them were too thoroughly frightened to see the world with the poet's eye. In Sicily nobody was concerned for the safety of his soul, nobody was aware that he had a soul to be saved. Thoughtful people knew that certain things gave offense to the gods. That you must not flaunt your prosperity after the fashion of some American millionaires, who have discovered in recent years that there is a basis of fact for the Greek feeling that it is wise to hold great possessions modestly. That certain family and state relations are sacred, and that the fate of Oedipus was a warning, 
but nobody was making observations of his own frame of mind, there were no thermometers to take the spiritual temperature. In his representative capacity as poet, Theocritus, speaking for his people, might have said with Gautier, I am a man for whom the visible world exists. It is as impossible to cut the visible world loose from the invisible as to see the solid stretch of earth without seeing the light that streams upon it and makes the landscape. But Gautier came as near doing the impossible as any man could, and the goat herds and pipe players of Theocritus measurably approached this instable position. On Cape Cod, it is true, they looked up and not down, but it is also true that they looked in and not out, in Sicily they looked neither up nor down, but straight ahead. The inevitable shadows fell across the fields whence the distracted Demeter sought Persephone, and Enceladus, uneasily bearing the weight of Etna, poured out the vials of his wrath on thriving vineyards and on almond orchards white as with sea foam. But the haunting sense of disaster in some other world beyond the dip of the sea was absent. If the hope of living with the gods was faint and far, and the forms of vanished heroes were vague and dim, the fear of retribution beyond the gate of death was a mere blurring of the landscape by a mist that came and went. The two workmen whose talk Theocritus overhears and reports in the tenth idol are not discussing the welfare of their souls. They are not even awake to the hard conditions of labor, and take no thought about shorter hours and higher wages, they are interested chiefly in Bombica, Lean, Dusk, a Gypsy. Twinkling dice thy feet. Poppies thy lips, thy ways none knows how sweet. And they lighten the hard task of the reaper of the stubborn corn in this fashion. O oh, rich in fruit and corn blade, be this field. Tilled well, Demeter, and fair fruitage yield. Bind the sheaves, reapers, lest one, passing, say. A fig for these, they're never worth their pay. Let the moan swathes look northward, ye who mow. Or westward, for the ears grow fattest so. Avoid a noontide nap, ye threshing men. The chaff flies thickest from the corn ears then. Wake when the lark wakes, when he slumbers close. Your work, ye reapers, and at noontide doze. Boys, the frog's life for me. They need not him. Who fills the flagon, for in drink they swim. Better boil herbs, thou twaller after game. Then, splitting cummin, split thy hand in twain. In Sicily no reckoning of the waste of life had been kept, and armies and fleets had been spent as freely in the tumultuous centuries of conquest as if, in the overabundance of life, these losses need not be entered in the book of account. Theocritus distills this sense of fertility from the air, and the leaves of the idols are fairly astir with it. The central myth of the island has a meaning quite beyond the reach of accident, poetic as it is, its symbolism seems almost scientific. Under skies so full of the light which, in a real sense, creates the landscape, encircled by a sea which was fecund of gods and goddesses, Sicily was the teeming mother of flower-strewn fields and trees heavy with fruit. Trunks and boughs made firm by winds as the fruit grew mellow in the sun. Demeter moved through harvest fields and across the grassy slopes where herds are fed, a smiling goddess. Poppies and corn sheaves on each laden arm. Forgetfulness of the ills of life, dreams of Olympian beauty in tempered energy in the fields, are not these the secrets of the fair world which survives in the idols? The corn and wine were food for the gods who gave them as truly as for the men who plucked the ripened grain and pressed the fragrant grape. If there was a sense of awe in the presence of the gods, there was no sense of moral separation, no yawning chasm of unworthiness. The gods obeyed their impulses not less readily than the men and women they had created. Both had eaten of the fruit of the tree of life, but neither had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Anybody might happen upon Pan in some deeply shadowed place, and the danger of surprising Diana at her bath was not wholly imaginary. Religion was largely the sense of being neighbor to the gods, they were more prosperous than men and had more power, but they were different only in degree, and one might be on easy terms with them. They were created by the poetic mind, and they repaid it a thousandfold with the consciousness of a world haunted by near, familiar, and radiant divinity. 
The heresy which shattered the unity of life by dividing it between the religious and the secular had not come to confuse the souls of the good and put a full half of life in the hands of sinners. Religion was as natural as sunlight and as easy as breathing. There was little philosophy and less science in Sicily as Theocritus reports it. The devastating passion for knowledge had not brought self-consciousness in like a tide, nor had the desire to know about things taken the place of knowledge of the things themselves. The beauty of the world was a matter of experience, not of formal observation, and was seen directly as artists see a landscape before they bring technical skill to reproduce it. So far as the men and women who work and sing make love in the idols were concerned, the age was delightfully unintellectual and, therefore, normally poetic. The vocabulary of names for things was made up of descriptive rather than analytical words, and things were seen in wholes rather than in parts. From this point of view religion was as universal and all-enfolding as air, and the gods were as concrete and tangible as trees and rocks and stars. They were companionable with all sorts and conditions of men, and if one wished to represent them, he used symbols and images of divinely fashioned men and women, not philosophical ideas or scientific formulae. In this respect the Roman Catholic Church has been both a wise teacher and a tender guardian of lonely and sorrowful humanity. Homer was not a formal theologian, but the harvest of the seed of thought he sowed is not even now fully gathered. He peopled the whole world of imagination. Christianity is not only concrete but historic, and some day, when the way of abstraction has been abandoned for that way of vital knowledge, which is the path of the prophets, the saints, and the artists, it will again set the imagination aflame. Meantime Theocritus is a charming companion for those who hunger and thirst for beauty, and who long from time to time to hang up the trumpet of the reformer, and give themselves up to the song of the sea and the simple music of the shepherd's pipe. Colonialism in the United States by Henry Cabot Lodge This essay appeared originally in the Atlantic Monthly for May, 1883. During the thirty years which have elapsed since it was written the manifestations of the colonial spirit then apparent in the United States have not only altered in character but, I am glad to say, have weakened, diminished and become less noticeable. Since 1883, also, there has been much achieved by Americans in art and literature, in painting, in sculpture, in music, and particularly in architecture. Success in all these fields has, with few exceptions, been won by men working in the spirit which is not colonial. But which it was the purpose of this essay to inculcate as the true one to which alone we could look for fine and enduring achievement. I have called attention to the date at which the essay was written in order that those who read it may remember that it applies in certain points to the conditions of thirty years ago and not to those of the present day. Nothing is more interesting than to trace, through many years and almost endless wanderings and changes, the fortunes of an idea or habit of thought. The subject is a much neglected one, even in these days of sweeping and minute investigation, because the inherent difficulties are so great, and the necessary data so multifarious, confused, and sometimes contradictory. That absolute proof and smooth presentation seem well-nigh impossible. Yet the ideas, the opinions, even the prejudices of men, impalpable and indefinite as they are, have at times a wonderful vitality and force and are not without meaning and importance when looked at with considerate eyes. The conditions under which they have been developed may change or pass utterly away, while they, mere shadowy creations of the mind, will endure for generations. Long after the world to which it belonged has vanished, a habit of thought will live on, indelibly imprinted upon a race or nation, like the footprint of some extinct beast or bird upon a piece of stone. The solemn bigotry of the Spaniard is the fossil trace of the fierce struggle of eight hundred years with the Moors. The theory of the Lord's Day peculiar to the English race all over the world is the deeply branded sign of the brief reign of Puritanism. A certain fashion of thought prevailed half a century ago, another is popular today. There is a resemblance between the two, the existence of both is recognized, and both, without much consideration, are set down as sporadic and independent, which is by no means a safe conclusion. We have all heard of those rivers which are suddenly lost to sight in the bowels of the earth, and, coming as suddenly again to the surface, flow onward to the sea as before. 
or the wandering stream may turn aside into fresh fields, and, with new shapes and colors, seem to have no connection with the waters of its source or with those which finally mingle with the ocean. Yet, despite the disappearances and the changes, it is always the same river. It is exactly so with some kinds of ideas and modes of thought, those that are wholly distinct from the countless host of opinions which perish utterly, and are forgotten in a few years, or which are still oftener the creatures of a day, or an hour. And die by myriads, like the short-lived insects whose course is run between sunrise and sunset. The purpose of this essay is to discuss briefly certain opinions which belong to the more enduring class. They are sufficiently well known. When they are mentioned everyone will recognize them, and will admit their existence at the particular period to which they belong. The point which is overlooked is their connection and relationship. They all have the same pedigree, a marked resemblance to each other, and they derive their descent from a common ancestor. My intention is merely to trace the pedigree and narrate the history of this numerous and interesting family of ideas and habits of thought. I have entitled them collectively, Colonialism in the United States, a description which is perhaps more comprehensive than satisfactory or exact. In the year of grace 1776, we published to the world our Declaration of Independence. Six years later, England assented to the separation. These are tolerably familiar facts. That we have been striving ever since to make that independence real and complete, and that the work is not yet entirely finished, are not, perhaps, equally obvious truisms. The hard fighting by which we severed our connection with the mother country was in many ways the least difficult part of the work of building up a great and independent nation. The decision of the sword may be rude, but it is pretty sure to be speedy. Armed revolution is quick. A South American, in the exercise of his constitutional privileges, will rush into the street and declare a revolution in five minutes. A Frenchman will pull down one government today, and set up another tomorrow, besides giving new names to all the principal streets of Paris during the intervening night. We English-speaking people do not move quite so fast. We come more slowly to the boiling point, we are not fond of violent changes, and when we make them we consume a considerable time in the operation. Still, at the best, a revolution by force of arms is an affair of a few years. We broke with England in 1776, we had won our victory in 1782, and by the year 1789 we had a new national government fairly started. But if we are slower than other people in the conduct of revolutions, owing largely to our love of dogged fighting and inability to recognize defeat, we are infinitely more deliberate than our neighbors in altering, or even modifying. Our ideas and modes of thought. The slow mind and ingrained conservatism of the English race are the chief causes of their marvelous political and material success. After much obstinate fighting in the field, they have carried through the few revolutions which they have seen fit to engage in. But when they have undertaken to extend these revolutions to the domain of thought, there has arisen a spirit of stubborn and elusive resistance, which has seemed to set every effort, and even time itself, at defiance. By the Treaty of Paris our independence was acknowledged, and in name and theory was complete. We then entered upon the second stage in the conflict, that of ideas and opinions. True to our race and to our instincts, and with a wisdom which is one of the glories of our history, we carefully preserved the principles and forms of government and law, which traced an unbroken descent and growth from the days of the Saxon invasion. But while we kept so much that was of inestimable worth, we also retained, inevitably, of course, something which it would have been well for us to have shaken off together with the rule of George III. And the British Parliament. This was the colonial spirit in our modes of thought. The word, colonial, is preferable to the more obvious word, provincial, because the former is absolute, while the latter, by usage, has become in a great measure relative. We are very apt to call an opinion, a custom, or a neighbor, provincial, because we do not like the person or thing in question, and in this way the true value of the word has of late been frittered away. Colonialism, moreover, has in this connection historical point and value, while provincialism is general and meaningless. Colonialism is also susceptible of accurate definition. A colony is an offshoot from a parent stock, and its chief characteristic is dependence. 
In exact proportion as dependence lessens, the colony changes its nature and advances toward national existence. For a hundred and fifty years we were English colonies. Just before the revolution, in everything but the affairs of practical government, the precise point at which the break came, we were still colonies in the fullest sense of the term. Except in matters of food and drink, and of the wealth which we won from the soil and the ocean, we were in a state of complete material and intellectual dependence. Every luxury, and almost every manufactured article, came to us across the water. Our politics, except those which were purely local, were the politics of England, and so also were our foreign relations. Our books, our art, our authors, our commerce, were all English. And this was true of our colleges, our professions, our learning, our fashions, and our manners. There is no need here to go into the details which show the absolute supremacy of the colonial spirit and our entire intellectual dependence. When we sought to originate, we simply imitated. The conditions of our life could not be overcome. The universal prevalence of the colonial spirit at that period is shown most strongly by one great exception, just as the flash of lightning makes us realize the intense darkness of a thunderstorm at night. In the midst of the provincial and barren waste of our intellectual existence in the 18th century there stands out in sharp relief the luminous genius of Franklin. It is true that Franklin was cosmopolitan in thought, that his name and fame and achievements in science and literature belonged to mankind, but he was all this because he was genuinely and intensely American. His audacity, his fertility, his adaptability, are all characteristic of America, and not of an English colony. He moved with an easy and assured step, with a poise and balance which nothing could shake, among the great men of the world. He stood before kings and princes and courtiers, unmoved and unawed. He was strongly averse to breaking with England. But when the war came he was the one man who could go forth and represent to Europe the new nationality without a touch of the colonist about him. He met them all, great ministers and great sovereigns, on a common ground, as if the colonies of yesterday had been an independent nation for generations. His autobiography is the cornerstone, the first great work of American literature. The plain, direct style, almost worthy of Swift, the homely, forcible language, the humor, the observation, the knowledge of men, the worldly philosophy of that remarkable book, are familiar to all. But its best and, considering its date, its most extraordinary quality is its perfect originality. It is American in feeling, without any taint of English colonialism. Look at Franklin in the midst of that excellent Pennsylvania community. Compare him and his genius with his surroundings, and you get a better idea of what the colonial spirit was in America in those days, and how thoroughly men were saturated with it, than in any other way. In general terms it may be said that, outside of politics and the still latent democratic tendencies, the entire intellectual life of the colonists was drawn from England. And that to the mother country they looked for everything pertaining to the domain of thought. The colonists in the 18th century had, in a word, a thoroughly and deeply rooted habit of mental dependence. The manner in which we have gradually shaken off this dependence, retaining of the past only that which is good, constitutes the history of the decline of the colonial spirit in the United States. As this spirit existed everywhere at the outset, and brooded over the whole realm of intellect, we can in most cases trace its history best in the recurring and successful revolts against it, which, breaking out now here, now there, have at last brought it so near to final extinction. In 1789, after the seven years of disorder and demoralization which followed the close of the war, the United States government was established. Every visible political tie which bound us to England had been severed, and we were apparently entirely independent. But the shackles of the colonial spirit, which had been forging and welding for a century and a half, were still heavy upon us, and fettered all our mental action. The work of making our independence real and genuine was but half done, and the first struggle of the new national spirit with that of the colonial past was in the field of politics. And consumed twenty-five years before victory was finally obtained. We still felt that our fortunes were inextricably interwoven with those of Europe. 
we could not realize that what affected us nearly when we were a part of the British Empire no longer touched us as an independent nation. We can best understand how strong this feeling was by the effect which was produced here by the French Revolution. That tremendous convulsion, it may be said, was necessarily felt everywhere. But one much greater might take place in Europe today without producing here anything at all resembling the excitement of 1790. We had already achieved far more than the French Revolution ever accomplished. We had gone much farther on the democratic road than any other nation. Yet worthy men in the United States put on cockades and liberty caps, erected trees of liberty, called each other Citizen Brown and Citizen Smith, drank confusion to tyrants, and sang the wild songs of Paris. All this was done in a country where every privilege and artificial distinction had been swept away, and where the government was the creation of the people themselves. These ravings and symbols had a terrific reality in Paris and in Europe, and so, like colonists, we felt that they must have a meaning to us, and that the fate and fortunes of our ally were our fate and fortunes. A part of the people engaged in an imitation that became here the shallowest nonsense, while the other portion of the community, which was hostile to French ideas, took up and propagated the notion that the welfare of civilized society lay with England and with English opinions. Thus we had two great parties in the United States, working themselves up to white heat over the politics of England and France. The first heavy blow to the influence of foreign politics was Washington's proclamation of neutrality. It seems a very simple and obvious thing now, this policy of non-interference in the affairs of Europe which that proclamation inaugurated, and yet at the time men marveled at the step, and thought it very strange. Parties divided over it. People could not conceive how we could keep clear of the great stream of European events. One side disliked the proclamation as hostile to France, while the other approved it for the same reason. Even the Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, one of the most representative men of American democracy, resisted the neutrality policy in the genuine spirit of the colonist. Yet Washington's proclamation was simply the sequel to the Declaration of Independence. It merely amounted to saying, we have created a new nation, and England not only cannot govern us, but English and European politics are none of our business, and we propose to be independent of them and not meddle in them. The neutrality policy of Washington's administration was a great advance toward independence and a severe blow to colonialism in politics. Washington himself exerted a powerful influence against the colonial spirit. The principle of nationality, then just entering upon its long struggle with states' rights, was in its very nature hostile to everything colonial, and Washington, despite his Virginian traditions, was thoroughly imbued with the national spirit. He believed himself, and insensibly impressed his belief upon the people, that true nationality could only be obtained by keeping ourselves aloof from the conflicts and the politics of the old world. Then, too, his splendid personal dignity, which still holds us silent and respectful after the lapse of a hundred years, communicated itself to his office, and thence to the nation of which he was the representative. The colonial spirit withered away in the presence of Washington. The only thoroughgoing nationalist among the leaders of that time was Alexander Hamilton. He was not born in the States, and was therefore free from all local influences. And he was by nature imperious in temper and imperial in his views. The guiding principle of that great man's public career was the advancement of American nationality. He was called British Hamilton by the very men who wished to throw us into the arms of the French Republic. Because he was wedded to the principles and the forms of constitutional English government and sought to preserve them here adapted to new conditions. He desired to put our political inheritance to its proper use, but this was as far removed from the colonial spirit as possible. Instead of being British, Hamilton's intense eagerness for a strong national government made him the deadliest foe of the colonial spirit, which he did more to strangle and crush out than any other man of his time. The objects at which he aimed were continental supremacy, and complete independence in business, politics, and industry. In all these departments he saw the belittling effects of dependence, and so he assailed it by his reports and by his whole policy, foreign and domestic. So much of his work as he carried through had a far-reaching effect, and did a great deal to weaken the colonial spirit. 
but the strength of that spirit was best shown in the hostility or indifference which was displayed toward his projects. The great cause of opposition to Hamilton's financial policy proceeded, undoubtedly, from state jealousy of the central government. But the resistance to his foreign policy arose from the colonial ignorance which could not understand the real purpose of neutrality, and which thought that Hamilton was simply and stupidly endeavoring to force us toward England as against France. Washington, Hamilton, and John Adams, notwithstanding his New England prejudices, all did much while they were in power, as the heads of the Federalist Party, to cherish and increase national self-respect. And thereby eradicate colonialism from our politics. The lull in Europe, after the fall of the Federalists, led to a truce in the contests over foreign affairs in the United States, but with the renewal of war the old conflict broke out. The years from 1806 to 1812 are among the least creditable in our history. The Federalists ceased to be a national party and the fierce reaction against the French Revolution drove them into an unreasoning admiration of England. They looked to England for the salvation of civilized society. Their chief interest centered in English politics, and the resources of England formed the subject of their thoughts and studies, and furnished the theme of conversation at their dinner tables. It was just as bad on the other side. The Republicans still clung to their affection for France, notwithstanding the despotism of the empire. They regarded Napoleon with reverential awe, and shivered at the idea of plunging into hostilities with anyone. The foreign policy of Jefferson was that of a thorough colonist. He shrank with horror from war. He would have had us confine ourselves to agriculture, and to our flocks and herds, because our commerce, the commerce of a nation, was something with which other powers were likely to interfere. He wished us to exist in a state of complete commercial and industrial dependence, and allow England to carry for us and manufacture for us, as she did when we were colonies weighed down by the clauses of the Navigation Acts. His plans of resistance did not extend beyond the old colonial scheme of non-importation and non-intercourse agreements. Read the bitter debates in Congress of those years, and you find them filled with nothing but the politics of other nations. All the talk is saturated with colonial feeling. Even the names of opprobrium which the hostile parties applied to each other were borrowed. The Republicans called the Federalists Tories and the British faction, while the Federalists retorted by stigmatizing their opponents as Jacobins. During these sorry years, however, the last in which our politics bore the colonial character, a new party was growing up, which may be called the National Party, not as distinguished from the party of states' rights. But as the opposition to colonial ideas. This new movement was headed and rendered illustrious by such men as Henry Clay, John Quincy Adams, the brilliant group from South Carolina, comprising Calhoun, Langdon Chivas, and William Lowndes, and at a later period by Daniel Webster. Clay and the South Carolinians were the first to push forward the resistance to colonialism. Their policy was crude and ill-defined. They struck out blindly against the evil influence which, as they felt, was choking the current of national life, for they were convinced that, to be truly independent, the United States must fight somebody. Who that somebody should be was a secondary question. Of all the nations which had been kicking and cuffing us, England was, on the whole, the most arrogant, and offensive, and so the young nationalists dragged the country into the War of 1812. We were wonderfully successful at sea and at New Orleans, but in other respects this war was neither very prosperous nor very creditable, and the Treaty of Ghent was absolutely silent as to the objects for which we had expressly declared war. Nevertheless, the real purpose of the war was gained, despite the silent and almost meaningless treaty which concluded it. We had proved to the world and to ourselves that we existed as a nation. We had demonstrated the fact that we had ceased to be colonies. We had torn up colonialism in our public affairs by the roots, and we had crushed out the colonial spirit in our politics. After the War of 1812 our politics might be good, bad, or indifferent, but they were our own politics, and not those of Europe. The wretched colonial spirit which had belittled and warped them for twenty-five years had perished utterly, and with the Treaty of Ghent it was buried so deeply that not even its ghost has since then crossed our political pathway. 
Besides being the field where the first battle with the colonial spirit was fought out, politics then offered almost the only intellectual interest of the country, outside of commerce, which was still largely dependent in character. And very different in its scope from the great mercantile combinations of today. Religious controversy was of the past, and except in New England, where the liberal revolt against Calvinism was in progress, there was no great interest in theological questions. When the Constitution went into operation the professions of law and medicine were in their infancy. There was no literature, no art, no science, none of the multifarious interests which now divide and absorb the intellectual energies of the community. In the quarter of a century which closed with the Treaty of Ghent we can trace the development of the legal and medical professions, and their advance towards independence and originality. But in the literary efforts of the time we see the colonial spirit displayed more strongly than anywhere else, and in apparently undiminished vigor. Our first literature was political, and sprang from the discussions incident to the adoption of the Constitution. It was, however, devoted to our own affairs, and aimed at the foundation of a nation, and was therefore fresh, vigorous, often learned, and thoroughly American in tone. Its masterpiece was The Federalist, which marks an era in the history of constitutional discussion, and which was the conception of the thoroughly national mind of Hamilton. After the new government was established, our political writings, like our politics, drifted back to provincialism of thought, and were absorbed in the affairs of Europe. But the first advance on the road to literary independence was made by the early literature of the Constitution. It is to this period also, which covers the years from 1789 to 1815, that Washington Irving, the first of our great writers, belongs. This is not the place to enter into an analysis of Irving's genius, but it may be fairly said that while in feeling he was a thorough American, in literature he was a cosmopolitan. His easy style, the tinge of romance, and the mingling of the storyteller and the antiquarian remind us of his great contemporary, Walter Scott. In his quiet humor and gentle satire, we taste the flavor of Addison. In the charming legends with which he has consecrated the beauties of the Hudson River Valley, and thrown over that beautiful region the warm light of his imagination, we find the genuine love of country and of home. In like manner we perceive his historical taste and his patriotism in the last work of his life, the biography of his great namesake. But he wrought as well with the romance of Spain and of England. He was too great to be colonial. He did not find enough food for his imagination in the America of that day to be thoroughly American. He stands apart, a notable gift from America to English literature, but not a type of American literature itself. He had imitators and friends, whom it has been the fashion to call a school, but he founded no school, and died as he had lived, alone. He broke through the narrow trammels of colonialism himself, but the colonial spirit hung just as heavily upon the feeble literature about him. In those years also came the first poem of William Cullen Bryant, the first American poem with the quality of life and which was native and not of imported origin. In that same period too there flourished another literary man, who was far removed in every way from the brilliant editor of Diedrich Knickerbocker. But who illustrated by his struggle with colonialism the strength of that influence far better than Irving, who soared so easily above it. Noah Webster, poor, sturdy, independent, with a rude but surprising knowledge of philology, revolted in every nerve and fiber of his being against the enervating influence of the colonial past. The spirit of nationality had entered into his soul. He felt that the nation which he saw growing up about him was too great to take its orthography or its pronunciation blindly and obediently from the motherland. It was a new country and a new nation, and Webster determined that so far as in him lay it should have linguistic independence. It was an odd idea, but it came from his heart, and his national feeling found natural expression in the study of language, to which he devoted his life. He went into open rebellion against British tradition. He was snubbed, laughed at, and abused. He was regarded as little better than a madman to dare to set himself up against Johnson and his successors. But the hard-headed New Englander pressed on, and finally brought out his dictionary, a great work, which has fitly preserved his name. His knowledge was crude, his general theory mistaken, his system of changes has not stood the test of time, and was in itself contradictory. 
But the stubborn battle which he fought for literary independence and the hard blows he struck should never be forgotten. While the odds against which he contended and the opposition he aroused are admirable illustrations of the overpowering influence of the colonial spirit in our early literature. What the state of our literature was, what the feelings of our few literary men apart from these few exceptions, and what the spirit with which Webster did battle, all come out in a few lines written by an English poet. We can see everything as by a sudden flash of light, and we do not need to look farther to understand the condition of American literature in the early years of the century. In the waste of barbarism called the United States, the only oasis discovered by the delicate sensibilities of Mr. Thomas More was in the society of Mr. Joseph Denny, a clever editor and essayist, and his little circle of friends in Philadelphia. The lines commonly quoted in this connection are those in the epistle to Spencer, beginning. Yet, yet, forgive me, O ye sacred few, whom late by Delaware's green banks I knew, which describe the poet's feelings toward America, and his delight in the society of Mr. Denny and his friends. But the feelings and opinions of Moore are of no moment. The really important passage describes not the author, but what Denny and his companions said and thought, and has in this way historical if not poetic value. The lines occur among those addressed to the Boston frigate when the author was leaving Halifax. Farewell to the few I have left with regret. May they sometimes recall what I cannot forget. The delight of those evenings, too brief a delight. When in converse and song we have stolen on the night. When they've asked me the manners, the mind, or the mean. Of some bard I had known or some chief I had seen whose glory, though distant, they long had adored, whose name had oft hallowed the wine-cup they poured. And still, as with sympathy humble but true, I have told of each bright son of fame all I knew. They have listened, and sighed that the powerful stream of America's empire should pass like a dream, without leaving one relic of genius. To say, how sublime was the tide which had vanished away. The evils apprehended by these excellent gentlemen are much more strongly set forth in the previous epistle, but here we catch sight of the men themselves. There they sit adoring Englishmen, and eagerly inquiring about them of the gracious Mr. More, while they are dolefully sighing that the empire of America is to pass away and leave no relic of genius. In their small way they were doing what they could toward such a consummation. It may be said that this frame of mind was perfectly natural under the circumstances, but it is not to the purpose to inquire into causes and motives, it is enough to state the fact. Here was a set of men of more than average talents and education. Not men of real talent and quality, like Irving, but clever men, forming one of the two or three small groups of literary persons in the United States. They come before us as true provincials, steeped to the eyes in colonialism, and they fairly represent the condition of American literature at that time. They were slaves to the colonial spirit, which bowed before England and Europe. They have not left a name or a line which is remembered or read, except to serve as a historical illustration, and they will ultimately find their fit resting place in the footnotes of the historian. With the close of the English War the United States entered upon the second stage of their development. The new era, which began in 1815, lasted until 1861. It was a period of growth, not simply in the direction of a vast material prosperity in a rapidly increasing population, but in national sentiment, which made itself felt everywhere. Wherever we turn during those years, we discover a steady decline of the colonial influence. Politics had become wholly national and independent. The law was illustrated by great names, which take high rank in the annals of English jurisprudence. Medicine began to have its schools, and to show practitioners who no longer looked across the sea for inspiration. The Monroe Doctrine bore witness to the strong foreign policy of an independent people. The tariff gave evidence of the eager desire for industrial independence, which found practical expression in the fast-growing native manufacturers. Internal improvements were a sign of the general faith and interest in the development of the national resources. The rapid multiplication of inventions resulted from the natural genius of America in that important field, where it took almost at once a leading place. 
science began to have a home at our seats of learning, and in the land of Franklin found a congenial soil. But the colonial spirit, cast out from our politics and fast disappearing from business and the professions, still clung closely to literature, which must always be the best and last expression of a national mode of thought. In the admirable life of Cooper, recently published, by Professor Lounsbury, the condition of our literature in 1820 is described so vividly and so exactly that it cannot be improved. It is as follows. The intellectual dependence of America upon England at that period is something that it is now hard to understand. Political supremacy had been cast off, but the supremacy of opinion remained absolutely unshaken. Of creative literature there was then very little of any value produced, and to that little a foreign stamp was necessary, to give currency outside of the petty circle in which it originated. There was slight encouragement for the author to write. There was still less for the publisher to print. It was, indeed, a positive injury, ordinarily, to the commercial credit of a bookseller to bring out a volume of poetry or of prose fiction which had been written by an American. For it was almost certain to fail to pay expenses. A sort of critical literature was struggling, or rather gasping, for a life that was hardly worth living. For its most marked characteristic was its servile deference to English judgment and dread of English censure. It requires a painful and penitential examination of the reviews of the period to comprehend the utter abasement of mind with which the men of that day accepted the foreign estimate upon works written here, which had been read by themselves. But which it was clear had not been read by the critics whose opinions they echoed. Even the meekness with which they submitted to the most depreciatory estimate of themselves was outdone by the anxiety with which they hurried to assure the world that they, the most cultivated of the American race, did not presume to have so high an opinion of the writings of some one of their countrymen as had been expressed by enthusiasts, whose patriotism had proved too much for their discernment. Never was any class so eager to free itself from charges that imputed to it the presumption of holding independent views of its own. Out of the intellectual character of many of those who at that day pretended to be the representatives of the highest education in this country, it almost seemed that the element of manliness had been wholly eliminated. And that, along with its sturdy democracy, whom no obstacles thwarted and no dangers daunted, the new world was also to give birth to a race of literary cowards and parasites. The case is vigorously stated, but is not at all overcharged. Far stronger, indeed, then Professor Lounsbury's statement is the commentary furnished by Cooper's first book. This novel, now utterly forgotten, was entitled Precaution. Its scene was laid wholly in England. Its characters were drawn from English society, chiefly from the aristocracy of that favoured land, its conventional phrases were all English. Worst and most extraordinary of all, it professed to be by an English author, and was received on that theory without suspicion. In such a guise did the most popular of American novelists and one of the most eminent among modern writers of fiction first appear before his countrymen and the world. If this were not so pitiable, it would be utterly ludicrous and yet the most melancholy feature of the case is that Cooper was not in the least to blame, and no one found fault with him, for his action was regarded by everyone as a matter of course. In other words, the first step of an American entering upon a literary career was to pretend to be an Englishman, in order that he might win the approval, not of Englishmen, but of his own countrymen. If this preposterous state of public opinion had been a mere passing fashion it would hardly be worth recording. But it represented a fixed and settled habit of mind, and is only one example of a long series of similar phenomena. We look back to the years preceding the Revolution, and there we find this mental condition flourishing and strong. At that time it hardly calls for comment, because it was so perfectly natural. It is when we find such opinions existing in the year 1820 that we are conscious of their significance. They belong to colonists, and yet they are uttered by the citizens of a great and independent state. The sorriest part of it is that these views were chiefly held by the best educated portion of the community. The great body of the American people, who had cast out the colonial spirit from their politics and their business, and were fast destroying it in the professions, was sound and true. The parasitic literature of that day makes the boastful and rhetorical patriotism then in the exuberance of youth seem actually noble and fine, because, with all its faults, it was honest, 
genuine, and inspired by a real love of country. Yet it was during this period, between the years 1815 and 1861, that we began to have a literature of our own, and one in which any people could take a just pride. Cooper himself was the pioneer. In his second novel, The Spy, he threw off the wretched spirit of the colonist, and the story, which had once gained a popularity that broke down all barriers, was read everywhere with delight and approbation. The chief cause of the difference between the fate of this novel and that of its predecessor lies in the fact that the spy was of genuine native origin. Cooper knew and loved American scenery and life. He understood certain phases of American character on the prairie and the ocean, and his genius was no longer smothered by the dead colonialism of the past. The spy, and those of Cooper's novels which belong to the same class, have lived and will live, and certain American characters which he drew will likewise endure. He might have struggled all his life in the limbo of intellectual servitude to which Moore's friends consigned themselves, and no one would have cared for him then or remembered him now. But, with all his foibles, Cooper was inspired by an intense patriotism, and he had a bold, vigorous, aggressive nature. He freed his talents at a stroke, and giving them full play attained at once a worldwide reputation, which no man of colonial mind could ever have dreamed of reaching. Yet his countrymen, long before his days of strife and unpopularity, seem to have taken singularly little patriotic pride in his achievements, and the well-bred and well-educated shuddered to hear him called the American Scot. Not because they thought this truly colonial description inappropriate and misapplied, but because it was a piece of irreverent audacity toward a great light of English literature. Cooper was the first, after the close of the War of 1812, to cast off the colonial spirit and take up his position as a representative of genuine American literature. But he soon had companions, who carried still higher the standard which he had raised. To this period, which closed with our Civil War, belong many of the names which are today among those most cherished by English-speaking people everywhere. We see the national spirit in Longfellow turning from the themes of the old world to those of the new. In the beautiful creations of the sensitive and delicate imagination of Hawthorne, there was a new tone and a rich originality, and the same influence may be detected in the remarkable poems and the wild fancies of Poe. We find alike native strength in the sparkling verses of Holmes, in the pure and gentle poetry of Whittier, and in the firm, vigorous work of Lowell. A new leader of independent thought arises in Emerson, destined to achieve a worldwide reputation. A new school of historians appears, adorned by the talents of Prescott, Bancroft, and Motley. Many of these distinguished men were far removed in point of time from the beginning of the new era, but they all belonged to and were the result of the national movement. Which began its onward march as soon as we had shaken ourselves clear from the influence of the colonial spirit upon our public affairs by the struggle which culminated in Madison's War, as the Federalists loved to call it. These successes in the various departments of intellectual activity were all due to an instinctive revolt against colonialism. But, nevertheless, the old and time worn spirit which made Cooper pretend to be an Englishman in 1820 was very strong, and continued to impede our progress toward intellectual independence. We find it clinging to the lesser and weaker forms of literature. We see it in fashion and society and in habits of thought, but we find the best proof of its vitality in our sensitiveness to foreign opinion. This was a universal failing. The body of the people showed it by bitter resentment the cultivated and highly educated by abject submission and deprecation, or by cries of pain. As was natural in a very young nation, just awakened to its future destiny, just conscious of its still undeveloped strength, there was at this time a vast amount of exuberant self-satisfaction, of cheap rhetoric, and of noisy self-glorification. There was a corresponding readiness to take offense at the unfavorable opinion of outsiders, and at the same time an eager and insatiable curiosity to hear foreign opinions of any kind. We were, of course, very open to satire and attack. We were young, undeveloped, with a crude, almost raw civilization, and a great inclination to be boastful and conceited. Our English cousins, who had failed to conquer us, bore us no goodwill, and were quite ready to take all the revenge which books of travel and criticism could afford. It is to these years that Marriott, Trollope, Hamilton, Dickens, 
and a host of others belong. Most of their productions are quite forgotten now. The only ones which are still read, probably, are the American Notes and Martin Chuzzlewit, the former preserved by the fame of the author, the latter by its own merit as a novel. There was abundant truth in what Dickens said, to take the great novelist as the type of this group of foreign critics. It was an age in which Elijah Pogram and Jefferson Brick flourished rankly. It is also true that all that Dickens wrote was poisoned by his utter ingratitude, and that to describe the United States as populated by nothing but bricks and pograms was one-sided and malicious, and not true to facts. But the truth or the falsehood, the value or the worthlessness, of these criticisms are not of importance now. The striking fact, and the one we are in search of, is the manner in which we bore these censures when they appeared. We can appreciate contemporary feeling at that time only by delving in much forgotten literature, and even then we can hardly comprehend fully what we find, so completely has our habit of mind altered since those days. We received these strictures with a howl of anguish and a scream of mortified vanity. We winced and writhed, and were almost ready to go to war, because English travelers and writers abused us. It is usual now to refer these ebullitions of feeling to our youth, probably from analogy with the youth of an individual. But the analogy is misleading. Sensitiveness to foreign opinion is not especially characteristic of a youthful nation, or, at least, we have no cases to prove it, and in the absence of proof the theory falls. On the other hand, this excessive and almost morbid sensibility is a characteristic of provincial, colonial, or dependent states, especially in regard to the mother country. We raged and cried out against adverse English criticism, whether it was true or false, just or unjust, and we paid it this unnatural attention because the spirit of the colonist still lurked in our hearts and affected our mode of thought. We were advancing fast on the road to intellectual and moral independence, but we were still far from the goal. This second period in our history closed, as has been said, with the struggle generated by a great moral question, which finally absorbed all the thoughts and passions of the people, and culminated in a terrible civil war. We fought to preserve the integrity of the Union, we fought for our national life, and nationality prevailed. The magnitude of the conflict, the dreadful suffering which it caused for the sake of principle, the uprising of a great people, elevated and ennobled the whole country. The floodgates were opened, and the tremendous tide of national feeling swept away every meaner emotion. We came out of the battle, after an experience which brought a sudden maturity with it, stronger than ever, but much graver and soberer than before. We came out self-poised and self-reliant, with a true sense of dignity and of our national greatness, which years of peaceful development could not have given us. The sensitiveness to foreign opinion which had been the marked feature of our mental condition before the war had disappeared. It had vanished in the smoke of battle, as the colonial spirit disappeared from our politics in the War of 1812. Englishmen and Frenchmen have come and gone, and written their impressions of us, and made little splashes in the current of everyday topics, and have been forgotten. Just now it is the fashion for every Englishman who visits this country, particularly if he is a man of any note, to go home and tell the world what he thinks of us. Some of these writers do this without taking the trouble to come here first. Sometimes we read what they have to say out of curiosity. We accept what is true, whether unpalatable or not, philosophically, and smile at what is false. The general feeling is one of wholesome indifference. We no longer see salvation and happiness in favorable foreign opinion, or misery in the reverse. The colonial spirit in this direction also is practically extinct. But while this is true of the mass of the American people whose mental health is good, and is also true of the great body of sound public opinion in the United States, it has some marked exceptions. And these exceptions constitute the lingering remains of the colonial spirit, which survives, and shows itself here and there even at the present day, with a strange vitality. In the years which followed the close of the war, it seemed as if colonialism had been utterly extinguished, but, unfortunately, this was not the case. The multiplication of great fortunes, the growth of a class rich by inheritance, and the improvement in methods of travel and communication, all tended to carry large numbers of Americans to Europe. The luxurious fancies which were born of increased wealth, 
and the intellectual tastes which were developed by the advance of the higher education, and to which an old civilization offers peculiar advantages and attractions. Combined to breed in many persons a love of foreign life and foreign manners. These tendencies and opportunities have revived the dying spirit of colonialism. We see it most strongly in the leisure class, which is gradually increasing in this country. During the miserable ascendancy of the Second Empire, a band of these persons formed what was known as the American Colony, in Paris. Perhaps they still exist, if so, their existence is now less flagrant and more decent. When they were notorious they presented the melancholy spectacle of Americans admiring and aping the manners, habits, and vices of another nation, when that nation was bent and corrupted by the cheap, meretricious, and rotten system of the Third Napoleon. They furnished a very offensive example of peculiarly mean colonialism. This particular phase has departed, but the same sort of Americans are, unfortunately, still common in Europe. I do not mean, of course, those persons who go abroad to buy social consideration, nor the women who trade on their beauty or their wits to gain a brief and dishonoring notoriety. These last are merely adventurers and adventuresses, who are common to all nations. The people referred to here form that large class, comprising many excellent men and women, no doubt, who pass their lives in Europe, mourning over the inferiority of their own country, and who become thoroughly denationalized. They do not change into Frenchmen or Englishmen, but are simply disfigured and deformed Americans. We find the same wretched habit of thought in certain groups among the rich and idle people of our great eastern cities, especially in New York, because it is the metropolis. These groups are for the most part made up of young men who despise everything American and admire everything English. They talk and dress and walk and ride in certain ways, because they imagine that the English do these things after that fashion. They hold their own country in contempt, and lament the hard fate of their birth. They try to think that they form an aristocracy, and become at once ludicrous and despicable. The virtues which have made the upper classes in England what they are, and which take them into public affairs, into literature and politics, are forgotten, for Anglo-Americans imitate the vices or the follies of their models, and stop there. If all this were merely a fleeting fashion, an attack of Anglomania or of Gallomania, of which there have been instances enough everywhere, it would be of no consequence. But it is a recurrence of the old and deep-seated malady of colonialism. It is a lineal descendant of the old colonial family. The features are somewhat dim now, and the vitality is low, but there is no mistaking the hereditary traits. The people who thus despise their own land, and ape English manners, flatter themselves with being cosmopolitans, when in truth they are genuine colonists, petty and provincial to the last degree. We see a like tendency in the same limited but marked way in our literature. Some of our cleverest fiction is largely devoted to studying the character of our countrymen abroad. That is, either denationalized Americans or Americans with a foreign background. At times this species of literature resolves itself into an agonized effort to show how foreigners regard us, and to point out the defects which jar upon foreign susceptibilities even while it satirizes the denationalized American. The endeavor to turn ourselves inside out in order to appreciate the trivialities of life which impress foreigners unpleasantly is very unprofitable exertion, and the Europeanized American is not worth either study or satire. Writings of this kind, again, are intended to be cosmopolitan in tone, and to evince a knowledge of the world, and yet they are in reality steeped in colonialism. We cannot but regret the influence of a spirit which wastes fine powers of mind and keen perceptions in a fruitless striving and a morbid craving to know how we appear to foreigners, and to show what they think of us. We see, also, men and women of talent going abroad to study art and remaining there. The atmosphere of Europe is more congenial to such pursuits, and the struggle as nothing to what must be encountered here. But when it leads to an abandonment of America, the result is wholly vain. Sometimes these people become tolerably successful French artists, but their nationality and individuality have departed, and with them originality and force. The admirable school of etching which has arisen in New York, the beautiful work of American wood engraving, the Chelsea tiles of Lowe, which have won the highest prizes at English exhibitions. The silver of Tiffany, 
specimens of which were bought by the Japanese commissioners at the Paris Exposition, are all strong, genuine work, and are doing more for American art, and for all art. Then a wilderness of overeducated and denationalized Americans who are painting pictures and carving statues and writing music in Europe or in the United States, in the spirit of colonists, and bowed down by a wretched dependence. There is abundance of splendid material all about us here for the poet, the artist, or the novelist. The conditions are not the same as in Europe, but they are not on that account inferior. They are certainly as good. They may be better. Our business is not to grumble because they are different, for that is colonial. We must adapt ourselves to them, for we alone can use properly our own resources. And no work in art or literature ever has been, or ever will be, of any real or lasting value which is not true, original, and independent. If these remnants of the colonial spirit and influence were, as they look at first sight, merely trivial accidents, they would not be worth mentioning. But the range of their influence, although limited, affects an important class. It appears almost wholly among the rich or the highly educated in art and literature, that is, to a large extent among men and women of talent and refined sensibilities. The follies of those who imitate English habits belong really to but a small portion of even their own class. But as these follies are contemptible, the wholesome prejudice which they excite is naturally, but thoughtlessly, extended to all who have anything in common with those who are guilty of them. In this busy country of ours, the men of leisure and education, although increasing in number, are still few, and they have heavier duties and responsibilities than anywhere else. Public charities, public affairs, politics, literature, all demand the energies of such men. To the country which has given them wealth and leisure and education they owe the duty of faithful service, because they, and they alone, can afford to do that work which must be done without pay. The few who are imbued with the colonial spirit not only fail in their duty, and become contemptible and absurd, but they injure the influence and thwart the activity of the great majority of those who are similarly situated. And who are also patriotic and public-spirited. In art and literature the vain struggle to be somebody or something other than an American, the senseless admiration of everything foreign, and the morbid anxiety about our appearance before foreigners have the same deadening effect. Such qualities were bad enough in 1820. They are a thousand times meaner and more foolish now. They retard the march of true progress, which here, as elsewhere, must be in the direction of nationality and independence. This does not mean that we are to expect or to seek for something utterly different, something new and strange, in art, literature, or society. Originality is thinking for oneself. Simply to think differently from other people is eccentricity. Some of our English cousins, for instance, have undertaken to hold Walt Whitman up as the herald of the coming literature of American democracy, not because he was a genius, not for his merits alone. But largely because he departed from all received forms, and indulged in barbarous eccentricities. They mistake difference for originality. Whitman was a true and a great poet, but it was his power and imagination which made him so, not his eccentricities. When Whitman did best, he was, as a rule, nearest to the old and well-proved forms. We, like our contemporaries everywhere, are the heirs of the ages, and we must study the past, and learn from it, and advance from what has been already tried and found good. That is the only way to success anywhere, or in anything. But we cannot enter upon that or any other road until we are truly national and independent intellectually, and are ready to think for ourselves, and not look to foreigners in order to find out what they think. To those who grumble and sigh over the inferiority of America we may commend the opinion of a distinguished Englishman, as they prefer such authority. Mr. Herbert Spencer said, recently, I think that whatever difficulties they may have to surmount, and whatever tribulations they may have to pass through. The Americans may reasonably look forward to a time when they will have produced a civilization grander than any the world has known. Even the Englishmen whom our provincials of today adore, even those who are most hostile, pay a serious attention to America. 
That keen respect for success and anxious deference to power so characteristic of Great Britain find expression every day, more and more, in the English interest in the United States, now that we do not care in the least about it. And be it said in passing, no people despises more heartily than the English a man who does not love his country. To be despised abroad, and regarded with contempt and pity at home, is not a very lofty result of so much effort on the part of our lovers of the British. But it is the natural and fit reward of colonialism. Members of a great nation instinctively patronize colonists. It is interesting to examine the sources of the colonial spirit, and to trace its influence upon our history and its gradual decline. The study of a habit of mind, with its tenacity of life, is an instructive and entertaining branch of history. But if we lay history and philosophy aside, the colonial spirit as it survives today, although curious enough, is a mean and noxious thing, which cannot be too quickly or too thoroughly stamped out. It is the dying spirit of dependence, and wherever it still clings it injures, weakens, and degrades. It should be exorcised rapidly and completely, so that it will never return. I cannot close more fitly than with the noble words of Emerson. Let the passion for America cast out the passion for Europe. They who find America insipid, they for whom London and Paris have spoiled their own homes, can be spared to return to those cities. I not only see a career at home for more genius than we have, but for more than there is in the world. New York after Paris by W. C. Brownell. No American, not a commercial or otherwise hardened traveler, can have a soul so dead as to be incapable of emotion when, on his return from a long trip abroad, he catches sight of the low-lying and insignificant Long Island coast. One's excitement begins, indeed, with the pilot boat. The pilot boat is the first concrete symbol of those native and normal relations with one's fellow men, which one has so long observed an infinitely varied manifestation abroad, but always as a spectator and a stranger. And which one is now on the eve of sharing himself. As she comes up swiftly, white and graceful, drops her pilot, crosses the steamer's bows, tacks, and picks up her boat in the foaming wake, she presents a spectacle beside which the most picturesque Mediterranean craft with colored sails and lazy evolutions, appear mistily in the memory as elements of a feeble and conventional ideal. The ununiformed pilot clambers on board, makes his way to the bridge, and takes command with an equal lack of French manner and of English affectation distinctly palpable to the sense. Sharpened by long absence into observing native characteristics as closely as foreign ones. If the season be right the afternoon is bright, the range of vision apparently limitless, the sky nearly cloudless and, by contrast with the European firmament, almost colorless, the July sun such as no Parisian or Londoner ever saw. The French reproach us for having no word for, pattery, as distinct from, pays. We have the thing at all events, and cherish it, and it needs only the proximity of the foreigner, from whom in general we are so widely separated, to give our patriotism a tinge of the various chauvinism that exists in France itself. We fancy the feeling old-fashioned, and imagine ours to be the most cosmopolitan, the least prejudiced temperament in the world. It is reasonable that it should be. The extreme sensitiveness noticed in us by all foreign observers during the antebellum epoch, and ascribed by Tocqueville to our self-distrust, is naturally inconsistent with our position and circumstances today. A population greater than that of any of the great nations, isolated by the most enviable geographical felicity in the world from the narrowing influences of international jealousy apparent to every American who travels in Europe, is increasingly less concerned at criticism than a struggling provincial republic of half its size. And along with our self-confidence and our carelessness of, abroad, it is only with the grosser element among us that national conceit has deepened. In general, we are apt to fancy we have become cosmopolitan in proportion as we have lost our provincialism. With us surely the individual has not withered, and if the world has become more and more to him, it is because it is the world at large and not the pent-up confines of his own country's history and extent. La Patery, in danger would be quickly enough rescued, there is no need to prove that over again, even to our own satisfaction. But in general, La Patery, not being in any danger, 
being on the contrary apparently on the very crest of the wave of the world, it is felt not to need much of one's active consideration, and passively indeed is viewed by many people, probably. As a comfortable and gigantic contrivance for securing a free field in which the individual may expand and develop. America, says Emerson, America is opportunity. After all, the average American of the present day says, a country stands or falls by the number of properly expanded and developed individuals it possesses. But the happening of any one of a dozen things unexpectedly betrays that all this cosmopolitanism is in great measure, and so far as sentiment is concerned, a veneer and a disguise. Such a happening is the very change from blue water to grey that announces to the returning American the nearness of that country which he sometimes thinks he prizes more for what it stands for than for itself. It is not, he then feels with a sudden flood of emotion, that America is home, but that home is America. America comes suddenly to mean what it never meant before. Unhappily for this exaltation, ordinary life is not composed of emotional crises. It is ordinary life with a vengeance which one encounters in issuing from the steamer dock and facing again his native city. Paris never looked so lovely, so exquisite to the sense as it now appears in the memory. All that Parisian regularity, order, decorum, and beauty into which, although a stranger, your own activities fitted so perfectly that you were only half conscious of its existence, was not, then, merely normal, wholly a matter of course. Emerging into West Street, amid the solicitations of hack men, the tinkling jog trot of the most ignoble horse cars you have seen since leaving home, the dry dust blowing into your eyes, the gaping black holes of broken pavements. The unspeakable filth, the line of red brick buildings prematurely decrepit, the sagging multitude of telegraph wires, the clumsy electric lights depending before the beer saloon and the groggery. The curious confusion of spruceness and squalor in the aspect of these latter, which also seem legion, confronting all this for the first time in three years, say. You think with wonder of your disappointment at not finding the Tillery's gardens a mass of flowers, and with a blush of the times you have told Frenchmen that New York was very much like Paris. New York is at this moment the most foreign-looking city you have ever seen, in going abroad the American discounts the unexpected. Returning after the insensible orientation of Europe, the contrast with things recently familiar is prodigious, because one is so entirely unprepared for it. One thinks to be at home, and finds himself at the spectacle. New York is less like any European city than any European city is like any other. It is distinguished from them all, even from London, by the ignoble character of the res publici, and the refuge of taste, care, wealth, pride, self-respect even, in private and personal regions. A splendid carriage, liveried servants without and Paris dresses within, rattling over the scandalous paving, splashed by the neglected mud, catching the rusty drippings of the hideous elevated railway. Wrenching its axle in the tram track in avoiding a mountainous wagon load of commerce on this hand and a garbage cart on that, caught in a jam of horse cars and a blockade of trucks. Finally depositing its dainty freight to pick its way across a sidewalk eloquent of official neglect and private contumely. To a shop door or a residence stoop, such a contrast as this sets us off from Europe very definitely and in a very marked degree. There is no palpable New York in the sense in which there is a Paris, a Vienna, a Milan. You can touch it at no point. It is not even ocular. There is instead a Fifth Avenue, a Broadway, a Central Park, a Chatham Square. How they have dwindled, by the way. Fifth Avenue might be any one of a dozen London streets in the first impression it makes on the retina and leaves on the mind. The opposite side of Madison Square is but a step away. The spacious hall of the Fifth Avenue Hotel has shrunk to stifling proportions. 34th Street is a lane, the City Hall a bandbox. The Central Park a narrow strip of elegant landscape whose lateral limitations are constantly forced upon the sense by the Lennox Library on one side and a monster apartment house on the other. The American fondness for size, for pure bigness, needs explanation, it appears, we care for size, but inartistically, we care nothing for proportion, which is what makes size count. Everything is on the same scale, there is no play, no movement. 
an exception should be made in favor of the big business building and the apartment house which have arisen within a few years. And which have greatly accentuated the grotesqueness of the city's skyline as seen from either the New Jersey or the Long Island shore. They are perhaps rather high than big. Many of them were built before the authorities noticed them and followed unequally in the steps of other civilized municipal governments, from that of ancient Rome down, in prohibiting the passing of a fixed limit. But bigness has also evidently been one of their architectonic motives, and it is to be remarked that they are so far out of scale with the surrounding buildings as to avoid the usual commonplace, only by creating a positively disagreeable effect. The aspect of 57th Street between Broadway and 7th Avenue, for example, is certainly that of the world upside down, a Gothic church utterly concealed, not to say crushed, by contiguous flats, and confronted by the overwhelming Osborne, which towers above anything in the neighborhood, and perhaps makes the most powerful impression that the return traveler receives during his first week or two of strange sensations. Yet the Osborne's dimensions are not very different from those of the Arc de l'Etoile. It is true it does not face an avenue of majestic buildings a mile and a half long and 230 feet wide, but the association of these two structures, one a private enterprise and the other a public monument. Together with the obvious suggestions of each, furnish a not misleading illustration of both the spectacular and the moral contrast between New York and Paris, as it appears unduly magnified no doubt to the sense surprised to notice it at all. Still another reason for the foreign aspect of the New Yorker's native city is the gradual withdrawing of the American element into certain quarters, its transformation or essential modification in others. And in the rest the presence of the lees of Europe. At every step you are forced to realize that New York is the second Irish and the third or fourth German city in the world. However great our success in drilling this foreign contingent of our social army into order and reason and self-respect, and it is not to be doubted that this success gives us a distinction wholly new in history, nevertheless our effect upon its members has been in the direction of development rather than of assimilation. We have given them our opportunity, permitted them the expansion denied them in their own several feudalities, made men of serfs, demonstrated the utility of self-government under the most trying conditions. Proved the efficacy of our elastic institutions on a scale truly grandiose. But evidently, so far as New York is concerned, we have done this at the sacrifice of a distinct and obvious nationality. To an observant sense New York is nearly as little national as Port said. It contrasts absolutely in this respect with Paris, whose assimilating power is prodigious, every foreigner in Paris eagerly seeks Parisianization. Ocularly, therefore, that note of New York seems that of characterless individualism. The monotony of the chaotic composition and movement is, paradoxically, its most abiding impression. And as the whole is destitute of definiteness, of distinction, the parts are, correspondingly, individually insignificant. Where in the world are all the types? One asks oneself in renewing his old walks and desultory wanderings. Where is the New York counterpart of that astonishing variety of types which makes Paris what it is morally and pictorially? the Paris of Balzac as well as the Paris of M. Jean Birod. Of a sudden the lack of nationality in our familiar literature and art becomes luminously explicable. One perceives why Mr. Howells is so successful in confining himself to the simplest, broadest, most representative representatives, why Mr. James goes abroad invariably for his mise en scene, and often for his characters, why Mr. Reinhardt lives in Paris, and Mr. Abbey in London. New York is this and that, it is incontestably unlike any other great city, but compared with Paris, its most impressive trait is its lack of that organic quality which results from variety of types. Thus compared, it seems to have only the variety of individuals which results in monotony. It is the difference between noise and music. Pictorially, the general aspect of New York is such that the mind speedily takes refuge in insensitiveness. Its expansiveness seeks exercise in other directions, business, dissipation, study, aestheticism, politics. The life of the senses is no longer possible. This is why one sense for art is so stimulated by going abroad, and one sense for art in its freest, 
Frankist, most universal and least special, intense and enervated development, is especially exhilarated by going to Paris. It is why, too, on one's return one can note the gradual decline of his sensitiveness, his severity, the progressive atrophy of a sense no longer called into exercise. I had no conception before, said a Chicago broker to me one day in Paris, with intelligent eloquence, of a finished city. Chicago undoubtedly presents a greater contrast to Paris than does New York, and so, perhaps, better prepares one to appreciate the Parisian quality, but the returned New Yorker cannot fail to be deeply impressed with the finish. The organic perfection, the elegance, and reserve of the Paris mirrored in his memory. Is it possible that the uniformity, the monotony of Paris architecture, the prose note in Parisian taste, should once have weighed upon his spirit? Riding once on the top of a Paris tramway, betraying an understanding of English by reading an American newspaper, that subconsciousness of moral isolation which the foreigner feels in Paris as elsewhere, was suddenly and completely destroyed by my next neighbor, who remarked with contemptuous conviction and a Manhattan accent, when you've seen one block of this infernal town you've seen it all. He felt sure of sympathy in advance. Probably few New Yorkers would have differed with him. The universal light stone and brown paint, the wide sidewalks, the asphalt pavement, the indefinitely multiplied kiosks, the prevalence of a few marked kinds of vehicles, the uniformed workmen and workwomen, the infinite reduplication, in a word of easily recognized types, is at first mistaken by the New Yorker for that dead level of uniformity which is, of all things in the world, the most tiresome to him in his own city. After a time, however, he begins to realize three important facts, in the first place these phenomena, which so vividly force themselves on his notice that their reduplication strikes him more than their qualities, are nevertheless of a quality altogether unexampled in his experience for fitness and agreeableness. In the second place, they are details of a whole, members of an organism, and not they, but the city which they compose, the finished city of the acute Chicagoan, is the spectacle. In the third place they serve as a background for the finest group of monuments in the world. On his return he perceives these things with a melancholy and non-lucendo luminousness. The dead level of Murray Hill uniformity he finds the most agreeable aspect in the city. And the reason is that Paris has habituated him to the exquisite, the rational, pleasure to be derived from that organic spectacle a finished city, far more than that Murray Hill is respectable and appropriate, and that almost any other prospect. Except in spots of very limited area which emphasize the surrounding ugliness, is acutely displeasing. This latter is certainly very true. We have long frankly reproached ourselves with having no art commensurate with our distinction in other activities, resignedly attributing the lack to our hitherto necessary material preoccupation. But what we are really accounting for in this way is our lack of Titians and Bramantes. We are for the most part quite unconscious of the character of the American aesthetic substratum, so to speak. As a matter of fact, we do far better in the production of striking artistic personalities than we do in the general medium of taste and culture. We figure well invariably at the salon. At home the artist is simply either driven in upon himself, or else awarded by a naive clientele, an eminence so far out of perspective as to result unfortunately both for him and for the community. He pleases himself, follows his own bent, and prefers salience to conformability for his work, because his chief aim is to make an effect. This is especially true of those of our architects who have ideas. But these are the exceptions, of course, and the general aspect of the city is characterized by something far less agreeable than mere lack of symmetry. It is characterized mainly by an all-pervading bad taste in every detail into which the element of art enters or should enter, that is to say, nearly everything that meets the eye. However, on the other hand, Parisian uniformity may depress exuberance, it is the condition and often the cause of the omnipresent good taste. Not only is it true that, as Mr. Hamerton remarks, in the better quarters of the city a building hardly ever rises from the ground unless it has been designed by some architect who knows what art is, and endeavors to apply it to little things as well as great. But it is equally true that the national sense of form expresses itself in every appurtenance of life as well as in the masses and details of architecture. 
In New York our noisy diversity not only prevents any effect of ensemble and makes, as I say, the old commonplace brownstone regions the most reposeful and rational prospects of the city, but it precludes also, in a thousand activities and aspects. The operation of that salutary constraint and conformity without which the most acutely sensitive individuality inevitably declines to a lower level of form and taste. La Mode, for example, seems scarcely to exist at all, or at any rate to have taken refuge in the chimney pot hat and the tenure. The dude, it is true, has been developed within a few years, but his distinguishing trait of personal extinction has had much less success and is destined to a much shorter life than his appellation which has wholly lost its original significance in gaining its present popularity. Every woman one meets in the street has a different bonnet. Every street car contains a millinery museum. And the mass of them may be judged after the circumstance that one of the most fashionable Fifth Avenue modistes flaunts a sign of enduring brass announcing English round hats and bonnets. The enormous establishments of ready-made men's clothing seem not yet to have made their destined impression in the direction of uniformity. The contrast in dress of the working classes with those of Paris is as conspicuously unfortunate aesthetically, as politically and socially it may be significant. Ocularly, it is a substitution of a cheap, faded, and ragged imitation of bourgeois costume for the marvel of neatness and propriety which composes the uniform of the Parisian ouvrier and ouvrière. Broadway below 10th Street is a forest of signs which obscure the thoroughfare, conceal the buildings, overhang the sidewalks, and exhibit severally and collectively a taste in harmony with the Teutonic and Semitic enterprise which, almost exclusively, they attest. The shop windows show, which is one of the great spectacles of Paris, is niggard and shabby, that of Philadelphia has considerably more interest, that of London nearly as much. Our clumsy coinage and countrified currency. Our eccentric bookbindings, that class of our furniture and interior decoration which may be described as American Rococo. That multifariously horrible machinery devised for excluding flies from houses and preventing them from alighting on dishes, for substituting a draft of air for stifling heat. For relieving an entire population from that surplusage of old-fashioned breeding involved in shutting doors, for rolling and rattling change in shops, for enabling you to put only the exact fare in the box. The racket of pneumatic tubes, of telephones, of aerial trains, the practice of reticulating pretentious facades with fire escapes in lieu of fireproof construction, the vast mass of our nickel-plated paraphernalia, our zinc cemetery monuments. Our comic valentines and serious Christmas cards, and grocery labels, and fancy job printing and theater posters, our conspicuous cuspidors and our conspicuous need of more of them. The tone of many articles in our most popular journals, their references to each other, their illustrations, the Sunday panorama of shirt-sleeved ease and the weekday fatigue costume of curl papers and mother hubbards general in some quarters. Our sumptuous new barrooms, decorated perhaps on the principle that Lomovais gout me no crime, all these phenomena, the list of which might be indefinitely extended, are so many witnesses of a general taste, public and private, which differs cardinally from that prevalent in Paris. In fine, the material spectacle of New York is such that at last, with some anxiety, one turns from the external vileness of every prospect to seek solace in the pleasure that man affords. But even after the wholesome American reaction has set in, and your appetite for the life of the senses is starved into indifference for what begins to seem to you an unworthy ideal. After you are patriotically readjusted and feel once more the elation of living in the future owing to the dearth of sustenance in the present, you are still at the mercy of perceptions too keenly sharpened by your Paris sojourn to permit blindness. To the fact that Paris and New York contrast as strongly in moral atmosphere as in material aspect. You become contemplative, and speculate pensively as to the character and quality of those native and normal conditions, those relations, which finally you have definitely resumed. What is it, that vague and pervasive moral contrast which the American feels so potently on his return from abroad? How can we define that apparently undefinable difference which is only the more sensible for being so elusive? Book after book has been written about Europe from the American standpoint about America from the European standpoint. 
none of them has specified what everyone has experienced. The spectacular and the material contrasts are easily enough characterized, and it is only the unreflecting or the superficial who exaggerate the importance of them. We are by no means at the mercy of our appreciation of Parisian spectacle, of the French machinery of life. We miss or we do not miss the Salon Care, the view of the south transept of Notre Dame as one descends the Rue St. Jacques, the Théâtre Francais, the concerts, the Luxembourg Gardens, the excursions to the score of charming suburban places, the library at the corner, the convenient cheap cab, the manners of the people, the quiet, the climate. The constant entertainment of the senses. We have in general too much work to do to waste much time in regretting these things. In general, work is by natural selection so invariable a concomitant of our unrivaled opportunity to work profitably, that it absorbs our energies so far as this palpable sphere is concerned. But what is it that throughout the hours of busiest work and closest application, as well as in the preceding and following moments of leisure and the occasional intervals of relaxation, makes everyone vaguely perceive the vast moral difference between life here at home and life abroad, notably life in France? What is the subtle influence pervading the moral atmosphere in New York, which so markedly distinguishes what we call life here from life in Paris or even in Penetope? It is, I think, distinctly traceable to the intense individualism which prevails among us. Magnificent results have followed our devotion to this force. Incontestably, we have spared ourselves both the acute and the chronic misery for which the tyranny of society over its constituent parts is directly responsible. We have, moreover, in this way not only freed ourselves from the tyranny of despotism, such for example as is exerted socially in England and politically in Russia but we have undoubtedly developed a larger number of self-reliant and potentially capable social units than even a democratic system like that of France, which sacrifices the unit to the organism, succeeds in producing. We may truly say that, material as we are accused of being, we turn out more men than any other nationality. And if some Frenchman points out that we attach an esoteric sense to the term man, and that at any rate our men are not better adapted than some others to a civilized environment which demands other qualities than honesty, energy, and intelligence, we may be quite content to leave him his objection, and to prefer what seems to us manliness, to civilization itself. At the same time we cannot pretend that individualism has done everything for us that could be desired. In giving us the man it has robbed us of the milieu. Morally speaking, the milieu with us scarcely exists. Our difference from Europe does not consist in the difference between the European milieu and ours, it consists in the fact that, comparatively speaking of course, we have no milieu. If we are individually developed, we are also individually isolated to a degree elsewhere unknown. Politically we have parties who, in Cicero's phrase, think the same things concerning the Republic, but concerning very little else are we agreed in any mass of any moment. The number of our sauces is growing, but there is no corresponding diminution in the number of our religions. We have no communities. Our villages even are apt, rather, to be aggregations. Politics aside, there is hardly an American view of any phenomenon or class of phenomena. Every one of us likes, reads, sees, does what he chooses. Often dissimilarity is affected as adding piquancy of paradox. The judgment of the ages, the consensus of mankind, exercise no tyranny over the individual will. Do you believe in this or that, do you like this or that, are questions which, concerning the most fundamental matters, nevertheless form the staple of conversation in many circles. We live all of us apparently in a divine state of flux. The question asked at dinner by a lady in a neighboring city of a literary stranger, what do you think of Shakespeare, is not exaggeratedly peculiar. We all think differently of Shakespeare, of Cromwell, of Titian, of Browning, of George Washington. Concerning matters as to which we must be fundamentally disinterested, we permit ourselves not only prejudice but passion. At the most we have here and there groups of personal acquaintance only, whose members are in accord in regard to some one thing. And quickly crystallize and precipitate at the mention of something that is really a corollary of the force which unites them. The efforts that have been made in New York, within the past twenty years, 
to establish various special milieus, so to speak, have been pathetic in their number and resultlessness. Efforts of this sort are of course doomed to failure, because the essential trait of the milieu is spontaneous existence, but their failure discloses the mutual repulsion which keeps the molecules of our society from uniting. How can it be otherwise when life is so speculative, so experimental, so wholly dependent on the personal force and idiosyncrasies of the individual? How shall we accept any general verdict pronounced by persons of no more authority than ourselves, and arrived at by processes in which we are equally expert? We have so little consensus as to anything, because we dread the loss of personality involved in submitting to conventions, and because personality operates centrifugally alone. We make exceptions in favor of such matters as the Copernican system and the greatness of our own future. There are things which we take on the credit of the consensus of authorities, for which we may not have all the proofs at hand. But as to conventions of all sorts, our attitude is apt to be one of suspicion and uncertainty. Mark Twain, for example, first won his way to the popular American heart by exposing the humbugs of the Cinquecento. Specifically the most teachable of people, nervously eager for information, Americans are nevertheless wholly distrustful of generalizations made by anyone else. And little disposed to receive blindly formularies and classifications of phenomena as to which they have had no experience. And of experience we have necessarily had, except politically, less than any civilized people in the world. We are infinitely more at home amid universal mobility. We want to act, to exert ourselves, to be, as we imagine, nearer to nature. We have our tastes in painting as in confectionery. Some of us prefer Tintoretto to Rembrandt, as we do chocolate to coconut. In respect of taste it would be impossible for the gloomiest skeptic to deny that this is an exceedingly free country. I don't know anything about the subject, whatever the subject may be, but I know what I like, is a remark which is heard on every hand and which witnesses the sturdiness of our struggle against the tyranny of conventions and the indomitable nature of our independent spirit. In criticism the individual spirit fairly runs amok, it takes its lack of concurrence as credentials of impartiality often. In constructive art everyone is occupied less with nature than with the point of view. Mr. Howells himself displays more delight in his naturalistic attitude than zest in his execution, which, compared with that of the French naturalists, is in general faint-hearted enough. Everyone writes, paints, models, exclusively the point of view. Fidelity in following out nature's suggestions, in depicting the emotions nature arouses, a sympathetic submission to nature's sentiment, absorption into nature's moods and subtle enfoldings, are extremely rare. The artist's eye is fixed on the treatment. He is, creative, by main strength. He is penetrated with a desire to get away from, the same old thing, to, take it, in a new way, to draw attention to himself, to shine. One would say that every American nowadays who handles a brush or designs a building, was stimulated by the secret ambition of founding a school. We have in art thus, with a vengeance, that personal element which is indeed its savor, but which it is fatal to make its substance. We have it still more conspicuously in life. What do you think of him, or her? Is the first question asked after every introduction. Of every new individual we meet we form instantly some personal impression. The criticism of character is nearly the one disinterested activity in which we have become expert. We have for this a peculiar gift, apparently, which we share with gypsies and money lenders, and other people in whom the social instinct is chiefly latent. Our gossip takes on the character of personal judgments rather than of tittle-tattle. It concerns not what so-and-so has done, but what kind of a person so-and-so is. It would hardly be too much to say that so-and-so never leaves a group of which he is not an intimate without being immediately, impartially but fundamentally, discussed. To a degree not at all suspected by the author of the phrase, he leaves his character, with them on quitting any assemblage of his acquaintance. The great difficulty with our individuality and independence is that differentiation begins so soon and stops so far short of real importance. In no department of life has the law of the survival of the fittest, that principle in virtue of whose operation societies become distinguished and admirable, had time to work. 
Our social characteristics are inventions, discoveries, not survival. Nothing with us has passed into the stage of instinct. And for this reason some of our best people, some of the most thoughtful among us, have less of that quality best characterized as social maturity than a Parisian washerwoman or concierge. Centuries of sifting, ages of gravitation toward harmony and homogeneity, have resulted for the French in a delightful immunity from the necessity of proving all things remorselessly laid on every individual of our society. Very many matters, at any rate, which to the French are matters of course, our self-respect pledges us to a personal examination of. The idea of sparing ourselves trouble in thinking occurs to us far more rarely than to other peoples. We have certainly an insufficient notion of the superior results reached by economy and system in this respect. In one of Mr. Henry James's cleverest sketches, Lady Barbarina, the English heroine marries an American and comes to live in New York. She finds it dull. She is homesick without quite knowing why. Mr. James is at his best in exhibiting at once the intensity of her disgust and the intangibility of its provocation. We are not all like Lady Barb. We do not all like London, whose materialism is only more splendid, not less uncompromising than our own. But we cannot help perceiving that what that unfortunate lady missed in New York was the milieu, an environment sufficiently developed to permit spontaneity and free play of thought and feeling. And a certain domination of shifting merit by fixed relations which keeps one's mind off that disagreeable subject of contemplation, oneself. Everyone seems acutely self-conscious, and the self-consciousness of the unit is fatal, of course, to the composure of the ensemble. The number of people intently minding their P's and Q's, reforming their orthoepy, practicing new discoveries in etiquette, making over their names. And in general exhibiting that activity of the amateur known as, going through the motions, to the end of bringing themselves up, as it were, is very noticeable in contrast with French oblivion to this kind of personal exertion. Even our simplicity is apt to be simplesse. And the conscientiousness in educating others displayed by those who are so fortunate as to have reached perfection nearly enough to permit relaxation in self-improvement is only equaled by the avidity in acquisitiveness displayed by the learners themselves. Meantime the composure born of equality, as well as that springing from unconsciousness, suffers. Our society is a kind of Jacob's ladder, to maintain equilibrium upon which requires an amount of effort on the part of the personally estimable gymnasts perpetually ascending and descending, in the highest degree hostile to spontaneity, to serenity, and stability. Naturally, Thus, everyone is personally preoccupied to a degree unknown in France. And it is not necessary that this preoccupation should concern any side of that multifarious monster we know as, business. It may relate strictly to the paradox of seeking employment for leisure. Even the latter is a terribly conscious proceeding. We go about it with a mental deliberateness singularly in contrast with our physical precipitancy. But it is mainly, business, perhaps, that accentuates our individualism. The condition of disoverment is positively disreputable. It arouses the suspicion of acquaintance and the anxiety of friends. Occupation to the end of money-getting is our normal condition, any variation from which demands explanation, as little likely to be entirely honorable. Such occupation is, as I said, the inevitable sequence of the opportunity for it, and is the wiser and more dignified because of its necessity to the end of securing independence. What the Frenchman can secure merely by the exercise of economy is with us only the reward of energy and enterprise in acquisition, so comparatively speculative and hazardous is the condition of our business. And whereas with us money is far harder to keep, and is moreover something which it is far harder to be without than is the case in France, the ends of self-respect, freedom from mortification, and getting the most out of life. Demand that we should take constant advantage of the fact that it is easier to get. Consequently everyone who is, as we say, worth anything, is with us adjusted to the prodigious dynamic condition which characterizes our existence. And such occupation is tremendously absorbing. Our opportunity is fatally handicapped by this remorseless necessity of embracing it. It yields us fruit after its kind, but it rigorously excludes us from tasting any other. 
Everyone is engaged in preparing the working drawings of his own fortune. There is no cooperation possible, because competition is the life of enterprise. In the resultant manners the city illustrates Carlyle's Anarchy plus the Constable. Never was the struggle for existence more palpable, more naked, and more unpictorial. It is the art of mankind to polish the world, says Thoreau somewhere, and everyone who works is scrubbing in some part. Everyone certainly is here at work, yet was there ever such scrubbing with so little resultant polish? The disproportion would be tragic if it were not grotesque. Amid all, the hurry and rush of life along the sidewalks, as the newspapers say, one might surely expect to find the unexpected. The spectacle ought certainly to have the interest of picturesqueness which is inherent in the fortuitous. Unhappily, though there is hurry and rush enough, it is the bustle of business, not the dynamics of what is properly to be called life. The elements of the picture lack dignity, so completely as to leave the ensemble quite without accent. More incidents in the drama of real life will happen before midnight to the individuals who compose the orderly boulevard procession in Paris than those of its chaotic Broadway counterpart will experience in a month. The latter are not really more impressive because they are apparently all running errands and include no flaneurs. The flaneur would fare ill should anything draw him into the stream. Everything being adjusted to the motive of looking out for oneself, any of the sidewalk civility and mutual interest which obtain in Paris would throw the entire machine out of gear. Whoever is not in a hurry is in the way. A man running after an omnibus at the Madeleine would come into collision with fewer people and cause less disturbance than one who should stop on 14th Street to apologize for an inadvertent jostle or to give a lady any surplusage of passing room. He would be less ridiculous. A friend recently returned from Paris told me that, on several street occasions, his involuntary, excuse me, had been mistaken for a salutation and answered by a, how do you do, and a stare of speculation. Apologies of this class sound to us, perhaps, like a subtle and deprecatory impeachment of our large tolerance and universal good nature. In this way our undoubted self-respect undoubtedly loses something of its bloom. We may prefer being jammed into streetcars and pressed against the platform rails of the elevated road to the tedious waiting at Paris bus stations, to mention one of the perennial and principal points of contrast which monopolize the thoughts of the average American sojourner in the French capital. But it is terribly vulgarizing. The contact and pressure are abominable. To a Parisian the daily experience in this respect of those of our women who have no carriages of their own would seem as singular as the latter would find the oriental habit of regarding the face as more important than other portions of the female person to keep concealed. But neither men nor women can persist in blushing at the intimacy of rudeness to which our crowding subjects them in common. The only resource is in blunted sensibility. And the manners thus negatively produced we do not quite appreciate in their enormity because the edge of our appreciation is thus necessarily dulled. The conductor scarcely ceases whistling to poke you for your fare. Other whistlers apparently go on forever. Loud talking follows naturally from the impossibility of personal seclusion in the presence of others. Our Sundays have lost secular decorum very much in proportion as they have lost Puritan observance. If we have nothing quite comparable with a London bank holiday, or with the conduct of the popular cohorts of the Epsom army. If only in political picnics and the excursions of gangs, of toughs, we illustrate absolute barbarism, it is nevertheless true that, from Central Park to Coney Island, our people exhibit a conception of the fitting employment of periodical leisure which would seem indecorous to a crowd of Belleville Alvriers. If we have not the CAD, we certainly possess in abundance the species hoodlum, which, though morally far more refreshing, is yet aesthetically intolerable, and the hoodlum is nearly as rare in Paris as the cad. Owing to his presence and to the atmosphere in which he thrives, we find ourselves, in spite of the most determined democratic convictions, shunning crowds whenever it is possible to shun them. The most robust of us easily get into the frame of mind of a Boston young woman, to whom the Champelassis looked like a railway station, and who wished the people would get up from the benches and go home. Our life becomes a life of the interior. Wherefore, in spite of a climate that permits walks abroad, 
we confine outdoor existence to Newport lawns and camps in the Adirondacks. And whence proceeds that carelessness of the exterior which subordinates architecture to household art, and makes of our streets such mere thoroughfares lined with homes. The manners one encounters in street and shop in Paris are, it is well known, very different from our own. But no praise of them ever quite prepares an American for their agreeableness and simplicity. We are always agreeably surprised at the absence of elaborate manner which eulogists of French manners in general omit to note, and indeed it is an extremely elusive quality. Nothing is further removed from that intrusion of the national gamuthlikite into so impersonal a matter as affairs, large or small, which to an occasional sense makes the occasional German manner enjoyable. Nothing is farther from the obsequiousness of the London shopman, which rather dazes the American than pleases him. Nothing, on the other hand, is farther from our own bald dispatch. With us every shopper expects, or at any rate is prepared for, obstruction rather than facilitation on the seller's side. The dry goods counter, especially when the attendant is of the gentler sex, is a kind of chevaux de frise. The retail atmosphere is charged with an affectation of unconsciousness, not only is every transaction impersonal, it is mechanical, ere long it must become automatic. In many cases there is to be encountered a certain defiant attitude to the last degree unhappy in its effects on the manners involved, a certain self-assertion which begs the question, else unmooted, of social equality. With the result for the time being of the most unsocial relation probably existing among men. Perfect personal equality for the time being invariably exists between customer and tradesman in France, the man or woman who serves you is first of all a fellow creature. A shop, to be sure, is not a conversazione. But if you are in a loquacious or inquisitive mood you will be deemed neither frivolous nor familiar, nor yet an inanimate obstacle to the flow of the most important as well as the most impetuous of the currents of life. Certainly, in New York, we are too vain of our bustle to realize how mannerless and motiveless it is. The essence of life is movement, but so is the essence of epilepsy. Moreover the life of the New Yorker who chases streetcars, eats at a lunch counter, drinks what will take hold quickly at a bar he can quit instantly, reads only the headlines of his newspaper. Keeps abreast of the intellectual movement by inspecting the display of the elevated railway newsstands while he fumes at having to wait two minutes for his train, hastily buys his tardy ticket of sidewalk speculators. And leaves the theater as if it were on fire, the life of such a man is, notwithstanding all its futile activity, varied by long spaces of absolute mental stagnation, of moral coma. Not only is our hurry not decorous, not decent. It is not real activity, it is as little as possible like the animated existence of Paris, where the moral nature is kept in constant operation, intense or not as the case may be, in spite of the external and material tranquility. Owing to this lack of a real, a rational activity, our individual civilization, which seems when successful a scramble, and when unlucky a sauve caput, is, morally as well as spectacularly. Not ill-described in so far as its external aspect is concerned by the epithet flat. Enervation seems to menace those whom hyperesthesia spares. We go to Europe to become Americanized, says Emerson, but France Americanizes us less in this sense than any other country of Europe. And perhaps Emerson was not thinking so much of her democratic development into social order and efficiency as of the less American and more feudal European influences, which do indeed, while we are subject to them. Intensify our affection for our own institutions, our confidence in our own outlook. One must admit that in France, which nowadays follows our ideal of liberty perhaps as closely as we do hers of equality and fraternity, and where consequently our political notions receive few shocks, not only is the life of the senses more agreeable than it is with us, but the mutual relations of men are more felicitous also. And alas! Americans who have savored these sweets cannot avail themselves of the implication contained in Emerson's further words, words which approach nearer to petulance than anything in his urbane and placid utterances, those who prefer London or Paris to. America may be spared to return to those capitals. I'll faux vivre, combattre, et finer avec les scenes, says Dudden, and no law is more inexorable. The fruits of foreign gardens are, however delectable, 
enchanted for us, we may not touch them. And to pass our lives in covetous inspection of them is as barren a performance as may be imagined. For this reason the question, should you like better to live here or abroad, is as little practical as it is frequent. The empty life of the foreign colonies in Paris is its sufficient answer. Not only do most of us have to stay at home, but for everyone except the inconsiderable few who can better do abroad the work they have to do, and except those essentially un-American waifs who can contrive no work for themselves. Life abroad is not only less profitable but less pleasant. The American endeavoring to acclimatize himself in Paris hardly needs to have cited to him the words of Epictetus, Man, thou hast forgotten thine object. Thy journey was not to this, but through this, he is sure before long to become dismally persuaded of their truth. More speedily than elsewhere perhaps, he finds out in Paris the truth of Carlyle's assurance, it is, after all, the one unhappiness of a man. That he cannot work, that he cannot get his destiny as a man fulfilled. For the work which ensures the felicity of the French life of the senses and of French human relations he cannot share. And, thus, the question of the relative attractiveness of French and American life, of Paris and New York, becomes the idle and purely speculative question as to whether one would like to change his personal and national identity. And this an American may permit himself the chauvinism of believing a less rational contradiction of instinct in himself than it would be in the case of anyone else. And for this reason, that in those elements of life which tend to the development and perfection of the individual soul in the work of fulfilling its mysterious destiny, American character and American conditions are especially rich. Bunyan's genius exhibits its characteristic felicity in giving the name of hopeful to the successor of that faithful who perished in the town of vanity. It would be a mark of that loose complacency in which we are too often offenders, to associate the scene of faithful's martyrdom with the Europe from which definitively we set out afresh a century ago. But it is impossible not to recognize that on our forward journey to the celestial country of national and individual success, our conspicuous inspiration and constant comforter is that hope whose cheering ministrations the weary titans of Europe enjoy in far narrower measure. Living in the future has an indisputably tonic effect upon the moral sinews, and contributes an exhilaration to the spirit which no sense of attainment and achieved success can give. We are after all the true idealists of the world. Material as are the details of our preoccupation, our subconsciousness is sustained by a general aspiration that is none the less heroic for being, perhaps, somewhat naive as well. The times and moods when one's energy is excited, when something occurs in the continuous drama of life to bring sharply into relief its vivid interest and one's own intimate share therein. When nature seems infinitely more real than the society she includes, when the missionary, the pioneer, the constructive spirit is aroused, are far more frequent with us than with other peoples. Our intense individualism happily modified by our equality, our constant, active, multiform struggle with the environment, do at least, as I said, produce men, and if we use the term in an esoteric sense we at least know its significance. Of our riches in this respect New York alone certainly gives no exaggerated idea, however it may otherwise epitomize and typify our national traits. A walk on Pennsylvania Avenue. A drive among the homes of Buffalo or Detroit, or a dozen other true centers of communal life which have a concrete impressiveness that for the most part only great capitals in Europe possess. A tour of college commencements in scores of spots consecrated to the exaltation of the permanent over the evanescent. Contact in any wise with the prodigious amount of right feeling manifested in a hundred ways throughout a country whose prosperity stimulates generous impulse, or with the number of good fellows, of large, shrewd, humorous views of life. Critical perhaps rather than constructive, but at all events untouched by cynicism, perfectly competent and admirably confident. With a livelier interest in everything within their range of vision than can be felt by anyone mainly occupied with sensuous satisfaction, saved from boredom by a robust imperviousness. Ready to begin life over again after every reverse with unenfeebled spirit, and finding, in the working out of their own personal salvation according to the gospel of necessity and opportunity. That joy which the pursuit of pleasure misses, experiences of every kind, in fine, 
that familiarize us with what is especially American in our civilization, are agreeable as no foreign experiences can be. Because they are above all others animating and sustaining. Life in America has for everyone, in proportion to his seriousness, the zest that accompanies the advance on chaos and the dark. Meantime, one's last word about the America emphasized by contrast with the organic and solidaire society of France, is that, for ensuring order and efficiency to the lines of this advance. It would be difficult to conceive too gravely the utility of observing attentively the work in the modern world of the only other great nation that follows the democratic standard, and is perennially prepared to make sacrifices for ideas. From French Traits, by W. C. Brownell. Copyright, 1888-1889, by Charles Scribner's Sons. The Tyranny of Things by Edward Sanford Martin. A traveler newly returned from the Pacific Ocean tells pleasant stories of the Patagonians. As the steamer he was in was passing through Magellan Strait some natives came out to her in boats. They wore no clothes at all, though there was snow in the air. A baby that came along with them made some demonstration that displeased its mother, who took it by the foot, as Thetis took Achilles, and soused it over the side of the boat into the cold seawater. When she pulled it in, it lay a moment whimpering in the bottom of the boat, and then curled up and went to sleep. The missionaries there have tried to teach the natives to wear clothes, and to sleep in huts. But, so far, the traveler says, with very limited success. The most shelter a Patagonian can endure is a little heap of rocks or a log to the windward of him, as for clothes, he despises them, and he is indifferent to ornament. To many of us, groaning under the oppression of modern conveniences, it seems lamentably meddlesome to undermine the simplicity of such people, and enervate them with the luxuries of civilization. To be able to sleep out odors, and go naked, and take sea baths on wintry days with impunity, would seem a most alluring emancipation. No rent to pay, no tailor, no plumber, no newspaper to be read on pain of getting behind the times. No regularity in anything, not even meals, nothing to do except to find food, and no expense for undertakers or physicians, even if we fail, what a fine, untrammeled life it would be. It takes occasional contact with such people as the Patagonians to keep us in mind that civilization is the mere cultivation of our wants, and that the higher it is the more our necessities are multiplied, until, if we are rich enough. We get enervated by luxury, and the young men come in and carry us out. We want so many, many things, it seems a pity that those simple Patagonians could not send missionaries to us to show us how to do without. The comforts of life, at the rate they are increasing, bid fair to bury us soon, as Tarpia was buried under the shields of her friends the Sabines. Mr. Haymerton, in speaking of the increase of comfort in England, groans at the trying strain of expense to which our extremely high standard of living subjects all accept the rich. It makes each individual of us very costly to keep, and constantly tempts people to concentrate on the maintenance of fewer individuals means that would in simpler times be divided among many. My grandfather, said a modern the other day, left $200,000. He was considered a rich man in those days, but, dear me. He supported four or five families, all his needy relations and all my grandmother's. Think of an income of $10,000 a year being equal to such a strain, and providing suitably for a rich man's large family in the bargain. It wouldn't go so far now, and yet most of the reasonable necessaries of life cost less today than they did two generations ago. The difference is that we need so very many comforts that were not invented in our grandfather's time. There is a hospital, in a city large enough to keep a large hospital busy, that is in straits for money. Its income from contributions last year was larger by nearly a third than its income ten years ago, but its expenses were nearly double its income. There were some satisfactory reasons for the discrepancy, the city had grown, the number of patients had increased. Extraordinary repairs had been made but at the bottom a very large expenditure seemed to be due to the struggle of the managers to keep the institution up to modern standards. The patients are better cared for than they used to be, the nurses are better taught and more skillful, conveniences have been greatly multiplied. The heating and cooking and laundry work is all done in the best manner with the most approved apparatus, 
the plumbing is as safe as sanitary engineering can make it, the appliances for antiseptic surgery are fit for a fight for life. There are detached buildings for contagious diseases, and an outpatient department, and the whole concern is administered with wisdom and economy. There is only one distressing circumstance about this excellent charity, and that is that its expenses exceed its income. And yet its managers have not been extravagant, they have only done what the enlightened experience of the day has considered to be necessary. If the hospital has to shut down and the patients must be turned out, at least the receiver will find a well-appointed institution of which the managers have no reason to be ashamed. The trouble seems to be with very many of us, in contemporary private life as well as in institutions, that the enlightened experience of the day invents more necessaries than we can get the money to pay for. Our opulent friends are constantly demonstrating to us by example how indispensably convenient the modern necessaries are. And we keep having them until we either exceed our incomes or miss the higher concerns of life in the effort to maintain a complete outfit of its creature comforts. And the saddest part of all is that it is in such great measure an American development. We Americans keep inventing new necessaries, and the people of the effete monarchies gradually adopt such of them as they can afford. When we go abroad we growl about the inconveniences of European life, the absence of gas in bedrooms, the scarcity and sluggishness of elevators, the primitive nature of the plumbing, and a long list of other things without which life seems to press unreasonably upon our endurance. Nevertheless, if the res and gusty damaget straighter than usual, we are always liable to send our families across the water to spend a season in the practice of economy in some land where it costs less to live. Of course it all belongs to progress, and no one is quite willing to have it stop, but it does a comfortable suffer good to get his head out of his conveniences sometimes and complain. There was a story in the newspapers the other day about a Massachusetts minister who resigned his charge because someone had given his parish a fine house, and his parishioners wanted him to live in it. His salary was too small, he said, to admit of his living in a big house, and he would not do it. He was even deaf to the proposal that he should share the proposed tenement with the sewing societies and clubs of his church, and when the matter came to a serious issue, he relinquished his charge and sought a new field of usefulness. The situation was an amusing instance of the embarrassment of riches. Let no one to whom restricted quarters may have grown irksome, and who covets larger dimensions of shelter, be too hasty in deciding that the minister was wrong. Did you ever see the house that Hawthorne lived in at Lennox? Did you ever see Emerson's house at Concord? They are good houses for Americans to know and remember. They permitted thought. A big house is one of the greediest cormorants which can light upon a little income. Backs may go threadbare and stomachs may worry along on indifferent filling, but a house will have things, though its occupants go without. It is rarely complete, and constantly tempts the imagination to flights in brick and dreams in lath and plaster. It develops annual thirsts for paint and wallpaper, at least, if not for marble and wood carving. The plumbing in it must be kept in order on pain of death. Whatever price is put on coal, it has to be heated in winter. And if it is rural or suburban, the grass about it must be cut even though funerals and the family have to be put off for the mowing. If the tenants are not rich enough to hire people to keep their house clean, they must do it themselves, for there is no excuse that will pass among housekeepers for a dirty house. The master of a house too big for him may expect to spend the leisure which might be made intellectually or spiritually profitable, in acquiring and putting into practice fag ends of the arts of the plumber, the bell hanger, the locksmith, the gas fitter, and the carpenter. Presently he will know how to do everything that can be done in the house, except enjoy himself. He will learn about taxes, too, and water rates, and how such abominations as sewers or new pavements are always liable to accrue at his expense. As for the mistress, she will be a slave to carpets and curtains, wallpaper, painters, and women who come in by the day to clean. She will be lucky if she gets a chance to say her prayers, and thrice and four times happy when she can read a book or visit with her friends. To live in a big house may be a luxury, provided that one has a full set of money and an enthusiastic housekeeper in one's family, but to scrimp in a big house is a miserable business. Yet such is human folly, 
that for a man to refuse to live in a house because it is too big for him, is such an exceptional exhibition of sense that it becomes the favorite paragraph of a day in the newspapers. An ideal of earthly comfort, so common that every reader must have seen it, is to get a house so big that it is burdensome to maintain, and fill it up so full of gym cracks that it is a constant occupation to keep it in order. Then, when the expense of living in it is so great that you can't afford to go away and rest from the burden of it, the situation is complete and boarding houses and cemeteries begin to yawn for you. How many Americans, do you suppose, out of the droves that flock annually to Europe, are running away from oppressive houses? When nature undertakes to provide a house, it fits the occupant. Animals which build by instinct build only what they need, but man's building instinct, if it gets a chance to spread itself at all, is boundless, just as all his instincts are. For it is man's peculiarity that nature has filled him with impulses to do things, and left it to his discretion when to stop. She never tells him when he has finished. And perhaps we ought not to be surprised that in so many cases it happens that he doesn't know, but just goes ahead as long as the materials last. If another man tries to oppress him, he understands that and is ready to fight to death and sacrifice all he has, rather than submit. But the tyranny of things is so subtle, so gradual in its approach, and comes so masked with seeming benefits, that it has him hopelessly bound before he suspects his fetters. He says from day to day, I will add thus to my house. I will have one or two more horses, I will make a little greenhouse in my garden, I will allow myself the luxury of another hired man and so he goes on having things and imagining that he is richer for them. Presently he begins to realize that it is the things that own him. He has piled them up on his shoulders, and there they sit like Sinbad's old man and drive him, and it becomes a daily question whether he can keep his trembling legs or not. All of which is not meant to prove that property has no real value, or to rebut Charles Lamb's scornful denial that enough is as good as a feast. It is not meant to apply to the rich, who can have things comfortably, if they are philosophical. But to us poor, who have constant need to remind ourselves that where the verbs to have and to be cannot both be completely inflected, the verb to be is the one that best repays concentration. Perhaps we would not be so prone to swamp ourselves with luxuries and vain possessions that we cannot afford, if it were not for our deep-lying propensity to associate with people who are better off than we are. It is usually the sight of their appliances that upsets our little stock of sense, and lures us into an improvident competition. There is a proverb of Solomon's which prophesies financial wreck or ultimate misfortune of some sort to people who make gifts to the rich. Though not expressly stated, it is somehow implied that the proverb is intended not as a warning to the rich themselves, who may doubtless exchange presents with impunity but for persons whose incomes rank somewhere between moderate circumstances and destitution. That such persons should need to be warned not to spend their substance on the rich seems odd, but when Solomon was busied with precept he could usually be trusted not to waste either words or wisdom. Poor people are constantly spending themselves upon the rich, not only because they like them, but often from an instinctive conviction that such expenditure is well invested. I wonder sometimes whether this is true. To associate with the rich seems pleasant and profitable. They are apt to be agreeable and well informed, and it is good to play with them and enjoy the usufruct of all their pleasant apparatus. But, of course, you can neither hope nor wish to get anything for nothing. Of the cost of the practice, the expenditure of time still seems to be the item that is most serious. It takes a great deal of time to cultivate the rich successfully. If they are working people their time is so much more valuable than yours, that when you visit with them it is apt to be your time that is sacrificed. If they are not working people it is worse yet. Their special outings, when they want your company, always come when you cannot get away from work except at some great sacrifice, which, under the stress of temptation, you are too apt to make. Their pleasuring is on so large a scale that you cannot make it fit your times or necessities. You can't go yachting for half a day, nor will fifty dollars take you far on the way to shoot big game in Manitoba. You simply cannot play with them when they play, because you cannot reach, and when they work you cannot play with them, because their time then is worth so much a minute that you cannot bear to waste it. 
And you cannot play with them when you are working yourself and they are inactively at leisure, because, cheap as your time is, you can't spare it. Charming and likable as they are, and good to know, it must be admitted that there is a superior convenience about associating most of the time with people who want to do about what we want to do at about the same time. And whose abilities to do what they wish approximate to ours. It is not so much a matter of persons as of times and means. You cannot make your opportunities concur with the opportunities of people whose incomes are ten times greater than yours. When you play together it is at a sacrifice, and one which you have to make. Solomon was right. To associate with very rich people involves sacrifices. You cannot even be rich yourself without expense, and you may just as well give over trying. Count it, then, among the costs of a considerable income that in enlarging the range of your sports it inevitably contracts the circle of those who will find it profitable to share them. From Windfalls of Observation, by Edward Sanford Martin. Copyright, 1893 by Charles Scribner's Sons. Free Trade Versus. Protection in Literature by Samuel McCord Crothers. I in the old-fashioned textbook we used to be told that the branch of learning that was treated was at once an art and a science. Literature is much more than that. It is an art, a science, a profession, a trade, and an accident. The literature that is of lasting value is an accident. It is something that happens. After it has happened, the historical critics busy themselves in explaining it. But they are not able to predict the next stroke of genius. Shelley defines poetry as the record of the best and happiest moments of the best and happiest minds. When we are fortunate enough to happen in upon an author at one of these happy moments, then, as the country newspaper would say, a very enjoyable time was had. After we have said all that can be said about art and craftsmanship, we put our hopes upon a happy chance. Literature cannot be standardized. We never know how the most painstaking work may turn out. The most that can be said of the literary life is what Sancho Panza said of the profession of knight errantry, there is something delightful in going about in expectation of accidents. After a meeting in behalf of social justice, an eager, distraught young man met me, in the streets of Boston, and asked. You believe in the principle of equality? Yes. Don't I then have just as much right to be a genius as Shakespeare had? Yes. Then why ain't I? I had to confess that I didn't know. It is with this chastened sense of our limitations that we meet for any organized attempt at the encouragement of literary productivity. Matthew Arnold's favorite bit of irreverence in which he seemed to find endless enjoyment was in twitting the unfortunate bishop who had said that something ought to be done for the Holy Trinity. It was a businesslike proposition that involved a spiritual incongruity. A confusion of values is likely to take place when we try to do something for American literature. It is an object that appeals to the uplifter who is anxious to get results. But the difficulty is that if a piece of writing is literature, it does not need to be uplifted. If it is not literature, it is likely to be so heavy that you can't lift it. We have been told that a man by taking thought cannot add a cubit to his stature. It is certainly true that we cannot add many cubits to our literary stature. If we could we should all be giants. When literary men discourse with one another about their art, they often seem to labor under a weight of responsibility which a friendly outsider would seek to lighten. They are under the impression that they have left undone many things which they ought to have done, and that the public blames them for their manifold transgressions. That great American novel ought to have been written long ago. There ought to be more local color and less imitation of European models. There ought to have been more plain speaking to demonstrate that we are not squeamish and are not tied to the apron strings of Mrs. Grundy. There ought to be a literary center and those who are at it ought to live up to it. In all this it is assumed that contemporary writers can control the literary situation. Let me comfort the overstrained consciences of the members of the writing fraternity. Your responsibility is not nearly so great as you imagine. Literature differs from the other arts in the relation in which the producer stands to the consumer. Literature can never be made one of the protected industries. In the drama the living actor has a complete monopoly. One might express a preference for Garrick or Booth, 
but if he goes to the theater he must take what is set before him. The monopoly of the singer is not quite so complete as it once was. But until canned music is improved, most people will prefer to get theirs fresh. In painting and in sculpture there is more or less competition with the work of other ages. Yet even here there is a measure of natural protection. The old masters may be admired, but they are expensive. The living artist can control a certain market of his own. There is also a great opportunity for the artist and his friends to exert pressure. When you go to an exhibition of new paintings, you are not a free agent. You are aware that the artist or his friends may be in the vicinity to observe how first citizen and second citizen enjoy the masterpiece. Conscious of this espionage, you endeavor to look pleased. You observe a picture which outrages your ideas of the possible. You mildly remark to a bystander that you have never seen anything like that before. Probably not, he replies, it is not a picture of any outward scene, it represents the artist's state of mind. Oh, you reply, I understand. He is making an exhibition of himself. It is all so personal that you do not feel like carrying the investigation further. You take what is set before you and ask no questions. But with a book the relation to the producer is altogether different. You go into your library and shut the door, and you have the same sense of intellectual freedom that you have when you go into the polling booth and mark your Australian ballot. You are a sovereign citizen. Nobody can know what you are reading unless you choose to tell. You snap your fingers at the critics. In the tumultuous privacy of print you enjoy what you find enjoyable, and let the rest go. Your mind is a free port. There are no customs house officers to examine the cargoes that are unladen. The book which has just come from the press has no advantage over the book that is a century old. In the matter of legibility the old volume may be preferable, and its price is less. Whatever choice you make is in the face of the free competition of all the ages. Literature is the timeless art. Clever writers who start fashions in the literary world should take account of this secrecy of the reader's position. It is easy enough to start a fashion, the difficulty is to get people to follow it. Few people will follow a fashion except when other people are looking at them. When they are alone they relapse into something which they enjoy and which they find comfortable. The ultimate consumer of literature is therefore inclined to take a philosophical view of the contentions among literary people, about what seem to them the violent fluctuations of taste. These fashions come and go, but the quiet reader is undisturbed. There are enough good books already printed to last his lifetime. Aware of this, he is not alarmed by the cries of the calamity howlers who predict a famine. From a purely commercial viewpoint, this competition with writers of all generations is disconcerting. But I do not see that anything can be done to prevent it. The principle of protection fails. Trades unionism offers no remedy. What if all the living authors should join in a general strike? We tremble to think of the army of strikebreakers that would rush in from all centuries. From the literary viewpoint, however, this free competition is very stimulating and even exciting. To hold our own under free trade conditions, we must not put all our thought on increasing the output. In order to meet the free competition to which we are exposed, we must improve the quality of our work. Perhaps that may be good for us. Dante and the Bowery by Theodore Roosevelt It is the conventional thing to praise Dante because he of set purpose, used the language of the marketplace, so as to be understanded of the common people. But we do not in practice either admire or understand a man who writes in the language of our own marketplace. It must be the Florentine marketplace of the 13th century, not Fulton Market of today. What infinite use Dante would have made of the Bowery? Of course, he could have done it only because not merely he himself, the great poet, but his audience also, would have accepted it as natural. The 19th century was more apt than the 13th to boast of itself as being the greatest of the centuries, but, save as regards purely material objects, ranging from locomotives to bank buildings, it did not wholly believe in its boasting. A 19th century poet, 
when trying to illustrate some point he was making, obviously felt uncomfortable in mentioning 19th century heroes if he also referred to those of classic times. Lest he should be suspected of instituting comparisons between them. A 13th century poet was not in the least troubled by any such misgivings, and quite simply illustrated his point by allusions to any character in history or romance, ancient or contemporary, that happened to occur to him. Of all the poets of the 19th century, Walt Whitman was the only one who dared use the Bowery, that is, use anything that was striking and vividly typical of the humanity around him, as Dante used the ordinary humanity of his day. And even Whitman was not quite natural in doing so, for he always felt that he was defying the conventions and prejudices of his neighbors, and his self-consciousness made him a little defiant. Dante was not defiant of conventions, the conventions of his day did not forbid him to use human nature just as he saw it, no less than human nature as he read about it. The Bowery is one of the great highways of humanity, a highway of seething life, of varied interest, of fun, of work, of sordid and terrible tragedy, and it is haunted by demons as evil as any that stalk through the pages of the Inferno. But no man of Dante's art and with Dante's soul would write of it nowadays, and he would hardly be understood if he did. Whitman wrote of homely things and everyday men, and of their greatness, but his art was not equal to his power and his purpose. And, even as it was, he, the poet, by set intention, of the democracy, is not known to the people as widely as he should be known, and it is only the few, the men like Edward Fitzgerald, John Burroughs, and W. E. Henley, who prize him as he ought to be prized. Nowadays, at the outset of the twentieth century, cultivated people would ridicule the poet who illustrated fundamental truths, as Dante did six hundred years ago. By examples drawn alike from human nature as he saw it around him and from human nature as he read of it. I suppose that this must be partly because we are so self-conscious as always to read a comparison into any illustration, forgetting the fact that no comparison is implied between two men. In the sense of estimating their relative greatness or importance, when the career of each of them is chosen merely to illustrate some given quality that both possess. It is also probably due to the fact that an age in which the critical faculty is greatly developed often tends to develop a certain querulous inability to understand the fundamental truths which less critical ages accept as a matter of course. To such critics it seems improper, and indeed ludicrous, to illustrate human nature by examples chosen alike from the Brooklyn Navy Yard or Castle Garden and the Piraeus. Alike from Tammany and from the Roman mob organized by the foes or friends of Caesar. To Dante such feeling itself would have been inexplicable. Dante dealt with those tremendous qualities of the human soul which dwarf all differences in outward and visible form and station, and therefore he illustrated what he meant by any example that seemed to him apt. Only the great names of antiquity had been handed down, and so, when he spoke of pride or violence or flattery, and wished to illustrate his thesis by an appeal to the past, he could speak only of great and prominent characters. But in the present of his day most of the men he knew, or knew of, were naturally people of no permanent importance, just as is the case in the present of our own day. Yet the passions of these men were the same as those of the heroes of old, godlike or demoniac. And so he unhesitatingly used his contemporaries, or his immediate predecessors, to illustrate his points, without regard to their prominence or lack of prominence. He was not concerned with the differences in their fortunes and careers, with their heroic proportions or lack of such proportions. He was a mystic whose imagination soared so high and whose thoughts plumbed so deeply the far depths of our being that he was also quite simply a realist. For the eternal mysteries were ever before his mind, and, compared to them, the differences between the careers of the mighty masters of mankind and the careers of even very humble people seemed trivial. If we translate his comparisons into the terms of our day, we are apt to feel amused over this trait of his, until we go a little deeper and understand that we are ourselves to blame. Because we have lost the faculty simply and naturally to recognize that the essential traits of humanity are shown alike by big men and by little men, in the lives that are now being lived and in those that are long ended. Probably no two characters in Dante impress the ordinary reader more than Farinata and Capenius, 
the man who raises himself waist high from out his burning sepulcher, unshaken by torment, and the man who, with scornful disdain, refuses to brush from his body the falling flames. The great souls, magnanimous, Dante calls them, whom no torture, no disaster, no failure of the most absolute kind could force to yield or to bow before the dread powers that had mastered them. Dante has created these men, has made them permanent additions to the great figures of the world, they are imaginary only in the sense that Achilles and Ulysses are imaginary, that is, they are now as real as the figures of any men that ever lived. One of them was a mythical hero in a mythical feat, the other a second-rate faction leader in a faction-ridden Italian city of the 13th century, whose deeds have not the slightest importance aside from what Dante's mention gives. Yet the two men are mentioned as naturally as Alexander and Caesar are mentioned. Evidently they are dwelt upon at length because Dante felt it his duty to express a peculiar horror for that fierce pride which could defy its overlord, while at the same time, and perhaps unwillingly, he could not conceal a certain shuddering admiration for the lofty courage on which this evil pride was based. The point I wish to make is the simplicity with which Dante illustrated one of the principles on which he lays most stress, by the example of a man who was of consequence only in the history of the parochial politics of Florence. Farinata will now live forever as a symbol of the soul, yet as an historical figure he is dwarfed beside any one of hundreds of the leaders in our own revolution and civil war. Tom Benton, of Missouri, and Jefferson Davis, of Mississippi, were opposed to one another with a bitterness which surpassed that which rived asunder Guelph from Gibellin, or Black Guelph from White Guelph. They played mighty parts in a tragedy more tremendous than any which any medieval city ever witnessed or could have witnessed. Each possessed an iron will and undaunted courage, physical and moral. Each led a life of varied interest and danger, and exercised a power not possible in the career of the Florentine. One, the champion of the Union, fought for his principles as unyieldingly as the other fought for what he deemed right in trying to break up the Union. Each was a colossal figure. Each, when the forces against which he fought overcame him, for in his latter years Benton saw the cause of disunion triumph in Missouri. Just as Jefferson Davis lived to see the cause of Union triumph in the nation, fronted an adverse fate with the frowning defiance, the high heart and the stubborn will which Dante has commemorated for all time in his hero who held hell in great scorn. Yet a modern poet who endeavored to illustrate such a point by reference to Benton and Davis would be uncomfortably conscious that his audience would laugh at him. He would feel ill at ease, and therefore would convey the impression of being ill at ease, exactly as he would feel that he was posing, was forced and unnatural. If he referred to the deeds of the evil heroes of the Paris Commune as he would without hesitation refer to the many similar but smaller leaders of riots in the Roman Forum. Dante speaks of a couple of French troubadours, or of a local Sicilian poet, just as he speaks of Euripides, and quite properly, for they illustrate as well what he has to teach. But we of today could not possibly speak of a couple of recent French poets or German novelists in the same connection without having an uncomfortable feeling that we ought to defend ourselves from possible misapprehension. And therefore we could not speak of them naturally. When Dante wishes to assail those guilty of crimes of violence, he in one stanza speaks of the torments inflicted by divine justice on Attila, coupling him with Pyrrhus and Sextus Pompey, a sufficiently odd conjunction in itself by the way. And in the next stanza mentions the names of a couple of local highwaymen who had made travel unsafe in particular neighborhoods. The two highwaymen in question were by no means as important as Jesse James and Billy the Kid, doubtless they were far less formidable fighting men, and their adventures were less striking and varied. Yet think of the way we should feel if a great poet should now arise who would incidentally illustrate the ferocity of the human heart by allusions both to the terrible Hunnish scourge of God, and to the outlaws who in our own times defied justice. In Missouri and New Mexico When Dante wishes to illustrate the fierce passions of the human heart, he may speak of Lycurgus, or of Saul, or he may speak of two local contemporary captains, victor or vanquished in obscure struggles between Guelph and Gibellin. Men like Jacopo del Casero or Buoncant, whom he mentions as naturally as he does Cyrus or Rehoboam. He is entirely right. 
What one among our own writers, however, would be able simply and naturally to mention Ulrich Dahlgren, or Custer, or Morgan, or Raphael Semmes, or Marion, or Sumter, as illustrating the qualities shown by Hannibal, or Ramesses. Or William the Conqueror, or by Moses or Hercules. Yet the Guelph and Gibellin captains of whom Dante speaks were in no way as important as these American soldiers of the second or third rank. Dante saw nothing incongruous in treating at length of the qualities of all of them. He was not thinking of comparing the genius of the unimportant local leader with the genius of the great sovereign conquerors of the past, he was thinking only of the qualities of courage and daring and of the awful horror of death. And when we deal with what is elemental in the human soul it matters but little whose soul we take. In the same way he mentions a couple of spendthrifts of Padua and Siena, who come to violent ends, just as in the preceding canto he had dwelt upon the tortures undergone by Dionysius and Simon de Montfort, guarded by Nessus and his fellow centaurs. For some reason he hated the spendthrifts in question as the Whigs of revolutionary South Carolina and New York hated Tarleton, Kruger, St. Ledger, and Delancey. And to him there was nothing incongruous in drawing a lesson from one couple of offenders more than from another. It would, by the way, be outside my present purpose to speak of the rather puzzling manner in which Dante confounds his own hatreds, with those of heaven, and, for instance, shows a vindictive enjoyment in putting his personal opponent Filippo Argenti in hell, for no clearly adequate reason. When he turns from those whom he is glad to see in hell toward those for whom he cares, he shows the same delightful power of penetrating through the externals into the essentials. Cato and Manfred illustrate his point no better than Balacqua, a contemporary Florentine maker of citherns. Alas! What poet today would dare to illustrate his argument by introducing Steinway in company with Cato and Manfred? Yet again, when examples of love are needed, he draws them from the wedding feast at Cana, from the actions of Pylades and Orestes, and from the life of a kindly, honest comb dealer of Siena who had just died. Could we now link together Peter Cooper and Pylades, without feeling a sense of incongruity? He couples Priscian with a politician of local note who had written an encyclopedia and a lawyer of distinction who had lectured at Bologna and Oxford. We could not now with such fine unconsciousness bring Everts and one of the compilers of the Encyclopedia Britannica into a life comparison. When Dante deals with the crimes which he most abhorred, simony and baratry, he flails offenders of his age who were of the same type as those who in our days flourish by political or commercial corruption. And he names his offenders, both those just dead and those still living, and puts them, popes and politicians alike, in hell. There have been trust magnates and politicians and editors and magazine writers in our own country whose lives and deeds were no more edifying than those of the men who lie in the third and the fifth chasm of the eighth circle of the inferno. Yet for a poet to name those men would be condemned as an instance of shocking taste. One age expresses itself naturally in a form that would be unnatural, and therefore undesirable, in another age. We do not express ourselves nowadays in epics at all. And we keep the emotions aroused in us by what is good or evil in the men of the present in a totally different compartment from that which holds our emotions concerning what was good or evil in the men of the past. An imitation of the letter of the times past, when the spirit has wholly altered, would be worse than useless, and the very qualities that helped to make Dante's poem immortal would, if copied nowadays, make the copyist ridiculous. Nevertheless, it would be a good thing if we could, in some measure, achieve the mighty Florentine's high simplicity of soul. At least to the extent of recognizing in those around us the eternal qualities which we admire or condemn in the men who wrought good or evil at any stage in the world's previous history. Dante's masterpiece is one of the supreme works of art that the ages have witnessed. But he would have been the last to wish that it should be treated only as a work of art, or worshipped only for art's sake, without reference to the dread lessons it teaches mankind. From History as Literature and Other Essays, by Theodore Roosevelt. Copyright, 1913, by Charles Scribner's Sons. The Revolt of the Unfit by Nicholas Murray Butler. There are wars and rumors of wars in a portion of the territory occupied by the doctrine of organic evolution. All is not working smoothly and well and according to formula. 
It begins to appear that those men of science who, having derived the doctrine of organic evolution in its modern form from observations on earthworms, on climbing plants, and on brightly colored birds, and who then straightway applied it blithely to man and his affairs, have made enemies of no small part of the human race. It was all well enough to treat some earthworms, some climbing plants, and some brightly colored birds as fit, and others as unfit, to survive. But when this distinction is extended over human beings and their economic, social, and political affairs, there is a general pricking up of ears. The consciously fit look down on the resulting discussions with complacent scorn. The consciously unfit rage and roar loudly, while the unconsciously unfit bestir themselves mightily to overturn the whole theory upon which the distinction between fitness and unfitness rests. If any law of nature makes so absurd a distinction as that, then the offending and obnoxious law must be repealed, and that quickly. The trouble appears to arise primarily from the fact that man does not like what may be termed his evolutionary poor relations. He is willing enough to read about earthworms and climbing plants and brightly colored birds, but he does not want nature to be making leaps from any of these to him. The earthworm, which, not being adapted to its surroundings, soon dies unhonored and unsung, passes peacefully out of life without either a coroner's inquest, an indictment for earthworm slaughter. A legislative proposal for the future protection of earthworms, or even a new society for the reform of the social and economic state of the earthworms that are left. Even the quasi-intelligent climbing plant and the brightly colored bird, humanly vain, find an equally inconspicuous fate awaiting them. This is the way nature operates when unimpeded or unchallenged by the powerful manifestations of human revolt or human revenge. Of course if man understood the place assigned to him in nature by the doctrine of organic evolution as well as the earthworm, the climbing plant, and the brightly colored bird understand theirs, he, too, like them, would submit to nature's processes and decrees without a protest. As a matter of logic, no doubt he ought to, but after all these centuries, it is still a far cry from logic to life. In fact, man, unless he is consciously and admittedly fit, revolts against the implication of the doctrine of evolution, and objects both to being considered unfit to survive and succeed, and to being forced to accept the only fate which nature offers to those who are unfit for survival and success. Indeed, he manifests with amazing pertinacity what Schopenhauer used to call, the will to live, and considerations and arguments based on adaptability to environment have no weight with him. So much the worse for environment, he cries. And straightway sets out to prove it. On the other hand, those humans who are classed by the doctrine of evolution as fit, exhibit a most disconcerting satisfaction with things as they are. The fit make no conscious struggle for existence. They do not have to. Being fit, they survive ipso facto. Thus does the doctrine of evolution, like a playful kitten, merrily pursue its tail with rapturous delight. The fit survive, those survive who are fit. Nothing could be more simple. Those who are not adapted to the conditions that surround them, however, rebel against the fate of the earthworm and the climbing plant and the brightly colored bird and engage in a conscious struggle for existence and for success in that existence despite their inappropriate environment. Statutes can be repealed or amended, why not laws of nature as well? Those human beings who are unfit have, it must be admitted, one great, though perhaps temporary, advantage over the laws of nature. For the laws of nature have not yet been granted suffrage, and the organized unfit can always lead a large majority to the polls. So soon as knowledge of this fact becomes common property, the laws of nature will have a bad quarter of an hour in more countries than one. The revolt of the unfit primarily takes the form of attempts to lessen and to limit competition, which is instinctively felt, and with reason, to be part of the struggle for existence and for success. The inequalities which nature makes, and without which the process of evolution could not go on, the unfit proposed to smooth away and to wipe out by that magic fiat of collective human will called legislation. The great struggle between the gods of Olympus and the Titans, which the ancient sculptors so loved to picture. Was child's play compared with the struggle between the laws of nature and the laws of man which the civilized world is apparently soon to be invited to witness? 
this struggle will bear a little examination, and it may be that the laws of nature, as the doctrine of evolution conceives and states them, will not have everything their own way. Professor Huxley, whose orthodoxy as an evolutionist will hardly be questioned, made a suggestion of this kind in his Romaine's lecture as long ago as 1893. He called attention then to the fact that there is a fallacy in the notion that because, on the whole, animals and plants have advanced in perfection of organization by means of the struggle for existence and the consequent survival of the fittest. Therefore, men as social and ethical beings must depend upon the same process to help them to perfection. As Professor Huxley suggests, this fallacy doubtless has its origin in the ambiguity of the phrase, survival of the fittest. One jumps to the conclusion that fittest means best, whereas, of course, it has in it no moral element whatever. The doctrine of evolution uses the term fitness in a hard and stern sense. Nothing more is meant by it than a measure of adaptation to surrounding conditions. Into this conception of fitness there enters no element of beauty, no element of morality, no element of progress toward an ideal. Fitness is a cold fact ascertainable with almost mathematical certainty. We now begin to catch sight of the real significance of this struggle between the laws of nature and the laws of man. From one point of view the struggle is hopeless from the start, from another it is full of promise. If it be true that man really proposes to halt the laws of nature by his legislation, then the struggle is hopeless. It is only a question of time when the laws of nature will have their way. If, on the other hand, the struggle between the laws of nature and the laws of man is in reality a mock struggle, and the supposed combat merely an exhibition of evolutionary boxing, then we may find a clue to what is really going on. It might be worthwhile, for example, to follow up the suggestion that in looking back over the whole series of products of organic evolution, the real successes and permanences of life are to be found among those species that have been able to institute something like what we call a social system. Wherever an individual insists upon treating himself as an end in himself, and all other individuals as his actual or potential competitors or enemies, then the fate of the earthworm, the climbing plant, and the brightly colored bird is sure to be his. For he has brought himself under the jurisdiction of one of nature's laws, and sooner or later he must succumb to that law of nature, and in the struggle for existence his place will be marked out for him by it with unerring precision. If, however, he has developed so far as to have risen to the lofty height of human sympathy, and thereby has learned to transcend his individuality and to make himself a member of a larger whole, he may then save himself from the extinction which follows inevitably upon proved unfitness in the individual struggle for existence. So soon as the individual has something to give, there will be those who have something to give to him, and he elevates himself above this relentless law with its inexorable punishments for the unfit. At that point, when individuals begin to give each to the other, then their mutual cooperation and interdependence build human society, and participation in that society changes the whole character of the human struggle. Nevertheless, large numbers of human beings carry with them into social and political relations the traditions and instincts of the old individualistic struggle for existence. With the laws of organic evolution pointing grimly to their several destinies. These are not able to realize that moral elements, and what we call progress toward an end or ideal, are not found under the operation of the law of natural selection, but have to be discovered elsewhere and added to it. Beauty, morality, Progress have other lurking places than in the struggle for existence, and they have for their sponsors other laws than that of natural selection. You will read the pages of Darwin and of Herbert Spencer in vain for any indication of how the Parthenon was produced, how the Sistine Madonna, how the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, how the Divine Comedy, or Hamlet or Faust. There are many mysteries left in the world, thank God, and these are some of them. The escape of genius from the cloud-covered mountaintops of the unknown into human society has not yet been accounted for. Even Rousseau made a mistake. When he was writing the Conrad Social it is recorded that his attention was favorably attracted by the island of Corsica. He, being engaged in the process of finding out how to repeal the laws of man by the laws of nature, spoke of Corsica as the one country in Europe that seemed to him capable of legislation. This led him to add, I have a presentiment that some day this little island will astonish Europe. 
It was not long before Corsica did astonish Europe, but not by any capacity for legislation. As some clever person has said, it let loose Napoleon. We know nothing more of the origin and advent of genius than that. Perhaps we should comprehend these things better were it not for the persistence of the superstition that human beings habitually think. There is no more persistent superstition than this. Linnaeus helped it on to an undeserved permanence when he devised the name Homo sapiens for the highest species of the order primates. That was the quintessence of complementary nomenclature. Of course human beings as such do not think. A real thinker is one of the rarest things in nature. He comes only at long intervals in human history, and when he does come, he is often astonishingly unwelcome. Indeed, he is sometimes speedily sent the way of the unfit and unprotesting earthworm. Emerson understood this, as he understood so many other of the deep things of life. For he wrote, Beware when the great God lets loose a thinker on this planet. Then all things are at risk. The plain fact is that man is not ruled by thinking. When man thinks he thinks, he usually merely feels, and his instincts and feelings are powerful precisely in proportion as they are irrational. Reason reveals the other side, and a knowledge of the other side is fatal to the driving power of a prejudice. Prejudices have their important uses, but it is well to try not to mix them up with principles. The underlying principle in the widespread and ominous revolt of the unfit is that moral considerations must outweigh the mere blind struggle for existence in human affairs. It is to this fact that we must hold fast if we would understand the world of today, and still more the world of tomorrow. The purpose of the revolt of the unfit is to substitute interdependence on a higher plane for the struggle for existence on a lower one. Who dares attempt to picture what will happen if this revolt shall not succeed? These are problems full of fascination. In one form or another they will persist as long as humanity itself. There is only one way of getting rid of them, and that is so charmingly and wittily pointed out by Robert Louis Stevenson in his fable, The Four Reformers, that I wish to quote it. Four reformers met under a bramble bush. They were all agreed the world must be changed. We must abolish property, said one. We must abolish marriage, said the second. We must abolish God, said the third. I wish we could abolish work, said the fourth. Do not let us get beyond practical politics, said the first. The first thing is to reduce men to a common level. The first thing, said the second, is to give freedom to the sexes. The first thing, said the third, is to find out how to do it. The first step, said the first, is to abolish the Bible. The first thing, said the second, is to abolish the laws. The first thing, said the third, is to abolish mankind. From Why Should We Change Our Form of Government, by Nicholas Murray Butler. Copyright, 1912, by Charles Scribner's Sons. On Translating the Odes of Horace by W. P. Trent. I in a letter written on August 21, 1703, to Robert Harley, afterward Earl of Oxford and Prime Minister, by Dr. George Hicks, the famous scholar and non-juror, there is a reference to Old Dr. By Ram Eaton who has read Horace over, as they tell me, many hundred times, oftener, I fear, than he has read the Gospels. Dr. By Ram Eaton has escaped an article in the Dictionary of National Biography, and, so far as I know, he has never been reckoned by Horatians among their patron saints. In view of the slur cast upon him by Dr. Hicks I should like to propose his canonization, but I should much prefer to lay a wager that he found time between his readings to try to turn some of the odes of his favorite writer into English verses. Probably into couplets resembling those of Dryden. And I should also be willing to wager that before and after making each of his versions, he gave expression, in some form or other, to the proverbial statement that to attempt to translate Horace is to attempt the impossible. Perhaps we owe to this proverbial impossibility the fact that the translator of Horace is always with us. A living antinomy, he writes a modest preface. Then exclaiming in the words of his master, Nil mortalibus ardui est, he tries to scale very heaven in his folly, to rush blindly per veditum nephus. But because he has loved much, therefore is much forgiven him. 
To love Horace and not attempt to translate him would be to flout that principle of altruism in which some modern thinkers have discovered, more poetically perhaps than philosophically, the motive force of civilization. We love Horace, and hence we must try to set him forth in a way to make others love him, is what all translators, it would seem, say to themselves, consciously or unconsciously, when they decide to publish their respective renditions. And who shall blame them? Where is the critic competent to judge their work, who has not himself listened to the siren's song, if but for a moment in his youth, who has not a version of some ode of Horace hid away among his papers? The memory of which will doubtless forever prevent him from flinging a stone at any fellow offender. It is not only impossible to translate Horace adequately, but it is impossible to explain satisfactorily the causes of his unbounded popularity, a popularity illustrated by the fact that when that well-known group of American book lovers, the Bibliophile Society, were seeking to determine what great man of letters they would first honor by issuing one or more of his works in sumptuous form. They chose, not an author of their own day or nation or language, but a writer dead nearly two thousand years, of alien race and tongue, spokesman of a civilization remote and strange, the Horus of the Immortal Odes. Yet admirers of Lucretius and of Catullus tell us very plainly and insistently that this Horus of the Odes is not a great poet. We listen respectfully to the charge and somehow we do not seem greatly to resent it. We merely read the Odes, if possible, more diligently and affectionately, not, it is true, in the splendid bibliophile volumes, but in some well-worn pocket edition that has accompanied us on our journeys, or, like one I own, has helped us to while away the hours on a deer stand, through which the deer, as shy as the fawn with which the poet compared Chloe, simply would not run. If we own such a pocket volume, we leave our critical faculties in abeyance when Dante, in the Inferno, introduces Horace to us along with Homer and Ovid and Lucan. For do not our hearts tell us that in the truest sense of the phrase, he is worthy to walk with the greatest of this medievally assorted company? We feel sure that Virgil must have loved him as a man, we have proof that Milton admired him as a poet. We deny to him the grand manner, but we attribute to him every charm. When we seek to analyze this charm, we are left with the suspicion that, after we have pointed out many of its elements, such as humor, vivacity, kindliness, sententiousness, and the like, there are as many others, equally potent but more subtle. That escape us altogether. So we turn the hackneyed saying into, the charm is the man, and contentedly exchange analysis for enjoyment. And yet we are persuaded that no author is more worthy of the painstaking, detailed study characteristic of modern scholarship than is this same Epicurean poet, who so utterly defies analysis and would be the first. Were he not but, dust and a shade, to smile at our ponderous erudition. We feel that the scholar who shall devote the best years of his life to studying the influence of Horace upon subsequent writers in the chief literatures and to collecting the tributes that have been paid to his genius by the great and worthy of all lands and ages, will deserve sincere benedictions. We conclude, in short, that that exquisite epithet, the well-beloved, so inappropriately bestowed upon the worthless and flippant French king, belongs to Horace, and to Horace alone, Jure Divino. But this praise of Horace and this defense of his translators fails to justify or explain the writing of this paper. An honest confession being good for the soul, I will confess that the remarks that follow were first employed to introduce some versions of selected odes I was once rash enough to publish. It is not a good sportsman that shuts his eyes and bangs away with both barrels at a flock of birds, and I now doubt whether I was wise in trying to bring down readers, if not with my verse barrel, at least with my prose barrel. Being older, I use at present only one barrel at a time and, perhaps for the same reason, I am wont to try the prose barrel. And fortunately I can apply to the comments I intend to make on Horatian translators the quotation I used in order to mollify irate readers of my own verse renderings. It came from a once popular, now forgotten poet, the Rev. John Pomfret, and it ran as follows, it will be to little purpose, the author presumes, to offer any reasons why the following poems appear in public. For it is ten to one whether he gives the true, and if he does, it is much greater odds whether the gentle reader is so courteous as to believe him. 
So much has been written on the methods of Horace's translators, and so much remains to be written, that it is hard to determine where to begin. But perhaps the preface of the late Professor Conington to his well-known translation of the Odes will furnish a proper point of departure. Few persons, whether translators or readers, are likely to object to Conington's first premise that the translator ought to aim at some kind of metrical conformity to his original. To reproduce an original sapphic or alcaic stanza in blank verse, or in the couplets of Pope, is at once to repel the reader who knows Horace well. And to give the reader who is unacquainted with Latin lyric poetry a totally erroneous conception of the metrical and rhythmical methods of the poet. To render a compressed Latin verse by a diffuse English one is to do injustice, as Conington observes, to the sententiousness for which Horace is justly celebrated, although the English scholar, had he written after the appearance of Mr. Gladstone's attempt to render the odes, might with propriety have added that the translator should not, in his avoidance of diffuseness, be seduced by the facility of the octosyllabic couplet. To translate Horace's odes into anything but quatrains, except on occasions, is also to offend the meticulous Horatian and to mislead any reader who seeks to know the poet through an English rendering. It would seem, however, that when Professor Conington insisted that an English measure once adopted for the Alcaic must be used for every ode in which Horace employed the stanza just named, he went far toward hampering the translator, who, despite his proneness to offend, has his rights. That such uniformity ought to be aimed at, and that it will, as a rule, be aimed at, is doubtless true, but there is an element of the problem with which Conington does not seem sufficiently to have reckoned. This is rhyme, which he assumed to be necessary to a successful rendition of an ode of Horace. A particular stanza not employing rhyme may probably be used without resulting loss in translating every ode written in a special form. Yet this may not be the case with a stanza employing rhymes, if the translator aim, as he should, at a fairly, though not an awkwardly literal rendering of the language of his original. There will necessarily be coincidences of sound in a literal prose version of a Latin stanza that will suggest a definite and advantageous arrangement of rhymes for a poetical version. To adopt a certain English stanza in which to render a certain Latin stanza wherever it occurs, is to do away with this natural advantage, which presents itself oftener than might at first be supposed. Concrete examples will serve to make my meaning clear. The third ode of the first book, the admirable, Sic te diva potent cipri, is written in what is called the second Asclepiad meter. So is the delightful ninth ode of the third book, the Donec Gratis Irum. We will assume that for the first of these odes the translator has chosen a quatrain with alternating rhymes, A, B, A, B. Following Professor Conington's rule of uniformity, he must employ the same stanza for the second of the two odes, which, by the way, Conington himself did not do, for reasons which he gave at length. Now the fifth stanza of the Donec Gratis Irum runs as follows. Quid si prisca redit Venus. Diductos Hugo coget inio. Si flava excutator Chloe. Reject take padet genua lidi. This may be rendered in prose. What if the former love return and join with brazen yoke the parted ones, if yellow-haired Chloe be shaken off, and the door stand open for rejected Lydia? If my memory does not deceive me, it was this stanza, and especially one word in its last verse, that determined the arrangement of rhymes in a version I attempted years ago, Consul Planco. This verse seemed to run inevitably into an open stand for Lydia the door. It needed but a moment to detect in the first verse of the stanza a possible rhyme word. The syllable re of read it furnished more, not the most apt of rhymes with door, but still sufficient, as things go with amateur translators. And with a perhaps pardonable tautology I wrote. What if the former love once more? Return. Two other rhymes were found with little difficulty in the D of Diductos and in Excutator, which suggested wide and cast aside and the whole stanza, omitting strictly metrical considerations, appeared, or rather might have appeared, for I have changed it slightly, as follows. What if the former love once more? Return and yoke the sweethearts parted wide. If fair-haired Chloe be cast aside. And open stand for Lydia the door. 
This stanza seemed to have the merit of almost complete literalness, since it omitted only two epithets, and I thought it had no unpardonable defects of rhythm and diction. So I took it as a model, and with little difficulty translated the entire ode, with what success I should not say and others need not inquire. That rhymes and their position in the stanza are often determined for the translator by his original or else by a prose rendering of that original seems also to be shown by the following version of the closing ode of the first book, Karm. 38. The Graceful, Persico's ODI. I hate your Persian trappings, boy. Your linden woven crowns annoy. Cease searching for the spot where blows. The lingering rose. To simple myrtle nothing add. The myrtle miss becomes, my lad. Nor thee nor me drinking my wine. Neath close grown vine. Here, pure, boy, and displacent, displease or annoy, seem to determine, not merely the first rhyme, but the rhyme arrangement, a, a. And it needs but a glance at the close of the first stanza of the original to show that another word rhyming with, boy, would be hard to obtain. It follows that, if we are to have a quatrain, the third and fourth verses should probably be made to rhyme, b, b, and it is not difficult to comply with this requirement, or to cast the second stanza in the mold of the first. It is, alas, too true that no equivalent to, blows, will be found in Horace, that, sedulous curo, has been unceremoniously thrown aside, that the poet does not specifically mention, wine, as the beverage he liked to drink in his rustic arbor. But if rose, which Horace does mention, certainly, blows, or blooms very often in English verse, it is not too far-fetched to get, nothing ad, and, lad, out of, nihil alibors, and, ministrum. And vine, veet, has suggested, wine, to many generations of poets. But it is rhyme suggestions and their influence upon the choice of stanzaic form that have occasioned this mild protest against Professor Conington's precepts of rigid stanzaic conformity. I am convinced, from the above examples and from many more, not only that uniformity of stanza is not to be strictly insisted upon when one is employing rhymes, but also that translators should search more diligently than they appear to do for the rhyme suggestions implicit in so many Horatian stanzas. Upon other points it is easier to agree with Conington. For most of the odes the iambic movement natural to English is preferable, as Milton may be held to have perceived. He abandoned rhyme in his celebrated version of the Cosmolta Gracilis, I, V, and hence he had an excellent opportunity to indulge in experiments in so-called logoetic verse. But he clung to the iambic movement, and the fact is significant, although not to be pressed, since he gave us no other rendering of an entire ode. Here too, however, I must plead for a careful study of each ode by the would-be translator, for there seem to be cases in which it would be almost disastrous to attempt a version in iambics. Such a case is presented by the beautiful, Diffugera Nevis, 4, 7. The iambic renderings of Professor Conington and Sir Theodore Martin seem to stray far from the original movement, as far as the former's, no, scaping death, proclaims the year, does from the diction of Horace or of any other good poet. It is true that English dactyls are dangerous things especially in translations, where the padding or packing which is natural to the measure when employed in English, is increased by the padding inevitably introduced into a translation from a synthetic into an analytic language. Yet the dactylic movement of the first Archilochian, in which the Diffugera Nevis is written, is hardly without great loss to be represented by any use of English iambics. It presents more difficulty than the introduction of something resembling the movement of dactylic hexameters proper into our blank verse. When the translator makes up his mind to attempt a close approximation to the Horatian meter, it would seem that he should eschew the use of rhyme as likely to operate against that effect of likeness to the original which he is striving to secure. But, since the use of rhyme in lyric poetry appears, as Conington held, to be essential at present if the English version is to be acceptable as poetry, this close approximation can be desirable in a few special cases only. It will not do to dogmatize on such matters, but it may be safely said that no poet, not even Milton or Whitman, has yet accustomed the English or the American ear to the use of rhymeless verse in lyrical poetry. Here and there a successful rhymeless lyric, 
such as Collins's Ode to Evening and Tennyson's Alcaics on Milton, shows us that rhymeless stanzas may occasionally be used for lyric purposes with good effect. But thus far those translators of Horace who have made a practice of eschewing rhyme have failed, as a rule, like the first Lord Lytton ate to give us versions that charm. Yet charm is what the translator of Horace should chiefly endeavor to convey. I am still more confident that Conington was right when he insisted that the English rendering should be confined within the same number of lines as the Latin. He was surely right when he taxed Sir Theodore Martin, who so frequently violated this rule, with an exuberance that is totally at variance with the severity of the classics. Such exuberance is almost certain to result if the translator abandoned the strict number of the lines into which the Roman poet compressed his thought. It results, too, from the use of stanzas of over four verses each. There is no other rule of translating that will so effectively ensure a successful retention of the diction of the original as this of the line-for-line -line rendering, whenever such rendering is possible. And that the diction and the thought of the poet should be more closely followed than is usually the case, admits of no manner of doubt. We have already seen that a close scrutiny of the Latin will often suggest an almost literal rendering of the thought and diction. Such a rendering is more desired by the reader who is familiar with Horace than by the reader who is not, but it will be both pleasing and serviceable to the latter, if the quality of literalness be not too slavishly obtained. Metrical considerations and general smoothness ought, as a matter of course, to weigh with every translator, but surely they ought not to outweigh accurate rendering of diction and thought. Especially the diction and thought of a poet so felicitous as Horace in his phrasing, and so just and happy in his observation of life. In this connection I am not sure but that Conington went too far when he recommended the Horatian translator to hold by the diction of our own Augustan period. That the age of Pope corresponds in many ways with that of Horace is true enough. And the student of the poetry of the 18th century who cares at all for the poets he studies is almost sure to be an admirer of the Roman bard whom Pope imitated. But the diction of Horace does not strike one as stilted, while that of Pope often does. And for a translator of our own days to employ a diction that seems in any way stilted is fatal and not merely to the popularity and hence to the present effectiveness of his work, but also, in all probability, to its intrinsic value. There is a good deal of the commonplace also in the poetry produced in the 18th century, but commonplace the translator of Horace can least afford to be. Horace himself may approach dangerously near the commonplace, yet he seems always to miss it by a dexterous and graceful turn. The translator, running after, will miss this turn sufficiently often, as it is. He cannot, therefore, afford to steep himself in a literature that has a tendency to the commonplace. But just as little can he afford to steep himself in the romantic poets from Shelley to Swinburne. A translation, whether from the Greek or the Latin, imbibing the luxuriance of imagination and phrasing characteristic of these modern poets, may satisfy a reader still in his intellectual teens. But the reader who makes use of a translation of Horace is likely to have passed out of that period of immaturity. It may be heretical, but I fancy that the translator of Horace who steeps himself in Keats or Tennyson, will be even less likely to give us the ideal rendering than the translator who steeps himself in Pope. Luxuriance and elegance may at times be more displeasing than excessive polish and point. To mention the 18th century is to bring up the thought of Horatian paraphrases. A successful paraphrase is sometimes better as poetry than a good poetical translation, and it not infrequently conveys a juster idea of the spirit of Horace. It is almost needless to praise the work in this kind of Mr. Austin Dobson and of the late Eugene Field. But a paraphrase, however good, can never be entirely satisfying either to the reader that knows Horace or to the reader that desires to know him. Nor can a prose version be thoroughly satisfactory. What is wanted is not merely the drift of the poet's thought, but, as near as may be, what he actually sang. The paraphrase may sing, and the prose version may give us the thought in nearly equivalent words, which may carry along with them not a little of the poet's feeling. But neither answers all our requirements as well as a good rendering in verse may do, such a rendering, for example, as that which the late Goldwyn Smith gave of the Scylla Tonantum, 3, v. 
Yet there is surely room for all these forms of approach to a poet who is, paradoxically enough, at one and the same time, the most approachable and the most unapproachable of writers. But one could write forever upon the topic of poetical translation in general, and of the translation of Horace's odes in particular. It is a subject about which people will differ to the end of time. A subject the principles of which will never be thoroughly exemplified in practice. Still, it always seems to fascinate those who discuss it, and they have a way of hoping that what they have said about it will not be without value to those who want to read about it. Hope springs eternal in the human breast, said the poet who also wrote of his great master lines that have not been surpassed in their kind. Horace still charms with graceful negligence. And without method talks us into sense. Will like a friend familiarly convey. The truest notions in the easiest way.